So good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we are going to start now with uh, uh, institutional greetings. And uh, uh, the first uh, very welcome uh, guest is uh, Roberto Pella. Uh, is the president president of the Confederation of Towns and Municipalities of Europe and the uh, first vice president of the National Association of Italian uh, Municipalities, and is also mayor of a uh, small towns, a small town Valdengo. So, uh, uh, honorably, I, I give you uh, the floor, please. Thank you for uh, inviting me at your conference to speak uh, about small town and municipality and uh, migration phenomenon. I bring my greetings to my colleague Dimitris, major of Tricala, and to everybody of you. I am here today as the first vice president of the National Association of Italian Municipality and as a president of the Confederation of Small Town in Europe, made up of France, Germany, Romania, and together with Italy. In these days, we are assisting to a large debate following the serious fact it in Cutro, in Calabria region. I would like to underline three key points. The first, we should keep talking about it in a political and scientific manner as you are doing with the PISTE project. Second, European Union should raise her voice and reinforce solution and political and economic levels towards a phenomenon that regards first of all human. And finally, the network of welcoming in place the involvement of 1,000 municipalities in Europe to guarantee dignity. As Confederation, we are now more united also because Romania experienced a similar situation as Italy after the war in Ukraine. But it is still not sufficient to impose a big change, and this is the reason why I am grateful for your commitment and the involvement of so many speakers and studies. In particular, I would like to thank my colleagues from Fontanigorda and Sassinoro in Italy, because I think that our country contributed a lot to this topic and to the welcoming model in small and very small municipalities. In uh, uh, 2021, or network activity more than on uh, with uh, hundreds of project in uh, 1.8 uh, municipality and the uh, 43% of them are small under 5000 inhabitants for a total of uh, 7000 people Participation in the territory by the beneficiaries of the network is essential for increasing social inclusion, building network and contributing to the community. Almost 74% participated in association, cultural initiative, recreational event, sport, group, voluntary work and public utility experiences. 
We overcame purely welfare logics, providing for measures aimed and integrate them with guidance and information services, having the clear objective of creating and emancipating welcome. With this vision as this approach in 20 years, we contributed to outlining also the professional figure of the welcoming operator, supporting the local network of reference. Finally, one one hand reception and on the other hand social inclusion and the more cohesion of the city community where hospitality is practice it. Have a great conference and a good day together. And thank you very much for the possibility to intervene today from Italy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable. Uh, much appreciated uh, in your, uh, your introduction. Uh, I uh, ask now uh, Gabriele Puccianti and Hortensia uh, Veres-Paton from uh, the uh, uh, Director General Migration and Home Affairs of the European uh, Commission uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, introduce uh, their, uh, uh, their uh, greetings. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you for the invitation to this conference and greetings from Brussels, where myself and my colleague Hortensia are talking to you from the Director General Migration and Home Affairs. I work in the unit responsible for integration and legal pathways. And uh, the unit goal is su to support the development and implementation of a common European policy on legal pathways to the EU and integration of third country nationals in the EU. So um, I would like, first of all, to congratulate the organizer and the city of Thessaloniki for hosting this event and all the distinguished guests which will enrich these two days uh, full agenda that we have ahead of us. I read from your mid term progress report, and I thank you for having it submitted timely, that despite some organizational inconvenience, you managed to organize this uh, conference today. And uh, I think we are all very glad to be there now with you. Um, PISTE is one of the transactional transnational sorry projects that we are responsible for in the unit and uh, uh, it comes as you know from the topic uh, in the AMIF call 2020 that wants to promote refugee and migrant participation in the design and implementation of integration and related policies at specifically local and regional level and um, I personally believe that this is where this kind of projects can be more effective with migrants and refugees. That's the level where really the people connect with the hosting country, the migrants and refugees, and this is where we can have a concrete impact on these people coming to the EU. Um, and I just wanted to tell you uh, shortly uh, um, that this topic uh, is very high in our agenda because um, we meet with many, we have many conferences, and many occasions when we hear from migrants and refugees. And I can tell that this is uh, definitely a very high topic in uh, everybody's mind we, because it's, it's really in life because it's really something concrete so congratulations for having this uh, conference and uh, starting a deep discussion on good practices i have been 
seeing in, a, in your report that you have uh, produced already some, you achieved already some deliverables, very interesting. Among them, for example, you publish uh, the first volume of Migra Towns and um, you, are, you had uh, kickoff meetings on all the working packages of the project. So it looks to me that uh, we are uh, on a good pace and the project is working very well. And, um, and also I, I'm very interested to listen and to see later on how these policy experiments that you want to take a, a local level will develop. We are really looking forward here uh, in our unit to create uh, networks and good practices and get good examples of how concretely this project translate in, really in something concrete and practical for, uh, for everybody for the society receiving and the migrants and the refugees. So I won't take more of your time. I want to just uh, to say these few words and um, I will pass now the floor to my other colleague, Hortensia. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriele. So, um, Eduardo, you, you know me. Thanks first for, for the invitation. Uh, I'm very happy also to be there, part of, of this uh, conference with many reflections. And, 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 and I guess uh, you, voila, you, you will uh, all enjoy as, as we, uh, we will do. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be there. It's, uh, Eduardo knows that I, I've been following the project since the beginning, more from the operational uh, implementation point of view. Um, it's a very interesting and uh, very dear project for us, I must say. As Gabriele said, uh, it's, uh, it's a project that has uh, grounds to be uh, to be something that will uh, will will improve will will bring something concrete uh, to the to the migrants uh, and um, so i i will just uh, i won't say many I, I won't be very long just pop in to say uh, hello and, and thank you and um, Maybe just uh, just to remind you. Well, I'm not going to go through all the all the deliverables and outputs that I that you have already reached in this first year of, of, of the project. You are midway, and I see that uh, the the consortium is uh, is 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 doing well uh, in spite of some difficulties uh, at the beginning. Uh, uh, that you are uh, cooperating very well, that you are a very balanced uh, uh, consortium uh, from what I see, from what I, my impression is. And um, well, I'll be, I'll be there, happy to, to listen, to learn, uh, to learn uh, on, on the project. On, and just to remind you maybe that there is this, uh, probably you know, that the new call, uh, AMIF call uh, 23 has been uh, published uh, and it's already uh, uh, waiting for, for proposals. Uh, the deadline, uh, I think it's the 16th of May, the, the closing date. So I encourage you, you all, uh, all the partners to to, to again to apply to to try to apply uh, I there is one topic maybe the topic two integration and inclusion at regional and local level that may be of interest to you and um, well you are all very uh, competent very uh, you are doing well in this project so I encourage you to to again to submit uh, or to participate to voila, to this new uh, Call. Thank you again. Uh, voila. I wish you a fruitful conference. Uh, we would have liked to be there, uh, Gabriele, but um, well, 
not uh, sometimes is, is not possible. And then uh, maybe uh, in another occasion by the end of the project. So thank you very much. Thank you, bye. Um, uh, connection problem with the municipality of Tricana. I would ask uh, uh, our host of Solidarity uh, Now. We are uh, hosted by uh, Solidarity Now and the, uh, yeah, uh, they, they uh, will uh, uh, present us what they do here. Thank you for being here. My name is Dora Sintamido. I'm currently working as a project manager for Solidarity Now in a, a big project called ACE, All Children in Education, where we are supporting uh, minors that are attending public schools with non formal education activities. So I will be uh, presenting a bit Solidarity Now and our work and the Blue Refugee Center, which is hosting the conference today. So Solidarity Now is a Greek non-profit humanitarian organization founded in 2013 to respond to the needs of the most vulnerable and marginalized groups of our society. So SN, Solidarity Now, SN supporters uh, are in Athens with large operations across Greece, including the urban centers of Thessaloniki and Ioannina. Essence actions fall under three strategic uh, priorities. The first one is safety and protection for the vulnerable again. The second is catalyzing livelihood opportunities. And the third is strengthening the independence of civil society and defending open society values. Today, to date, uh, SN has supported more than 350,000 beneficiaries through an array of programming. SN has proven experience in managing large scale uh, programs and partnerships, including with UNHCR, UNICEF, IOM, and the EEA grants, as well as numerous uh, small scale uh, targeted interventions. In more detail, SN is an implementing partner of UNHCR and UNICEF since 2016, and a partner of IOM since 2019. In collaboration with UNICEF, SN has facilitated the establishment and operation of child and family support hubs in refugee camps across mainland Greece, through which more than 14,000 children and caregivers have been supported. The project was implemented in 15 sites, where SN was responsible for child protection and non-formal education, through in interdisciplinary teams comprising social workers, psychologists, educators, lawyers, and interpreters. From 2021 to date, SN is in collaboration with UNICEF for the implementation of all children in education program, aiming to facilitate the integration of refugee and migrant children in the formal education setting through the provision of non-formal education activities and services in homework and creative activity centers and other complementary activities like psychosocial support for the families and the children. The project is implemented in six regions in uh, mainland Greece, namely Attica, Central Greece, Central and Eastern Macedonia, Epirus and Western Greece, and specifically in three urban centers and 12 open accommodation sites, the councils we all know them. To date, over 2,500 children have been supported through non-formal education and for registering to public schools. At the heart of our intervention, interventions like uh, the Solidarity Centers in Athens and in Thessaloniki here, the Blue Refugee, which is hosting the conference uh, today, the Blue Refugee Center, which provide holistic support to individuals at risk of social marginalization and exclusion, paving the way towards their empowerment and self-reliance. The services provided include non-formal education, social services, legal aid, psychosocial support and counseling, employability and, and accounting, uh, as well as cultural mediation, of course. Together, the centers have reached uh, over 90,000 individuals to date, providing an array of services to those in need, including asylum seekers and beneficiaries of international protection. 
SN is also one of IOM's, the International Organization of Migration, implementing partners for the ELOS integration project, through which over 3,000 individuals have been enrolled in educational classes to date through the three integration learning centers operated by uh, Solidarity Now in Athens, Thessaloniki, Ioannina, and uh, recently in Larissa as well. And the two ILCs in Kikis and Katerini established in collaboration with partner NGOs. In collaboration with UNHCR now, SN has established and maintained until 2021 more than 2,000 accommodation places and provided supporting services, a total of 6,592 beneficiaries, vulnerable asylum seekers across Greece, of which over half were children. Specifically, the STIA accommodation project has been implemented in Attica, Thessaloniki, and its area, Ioannina, Tilos, Evia, and the Polaponis. So in 2020, SN started the implementation two other programs supporting unaccompanied minors. Through the first program, SN operated semi-independent living apartments in the urban centers of Athens uh, and Thessaloniki for unaccompanied minors aged between 16 to 18 years old. The project was funded by the National Asylum Migration and Integration Fund, the AMIF, and through the second program, SN has provided emergency support to 170 uh, unaccompanied minors through the operation of transit hubs in Northern Greece, namely Kozani, Konica, uh, and Ioannina. From January 2022 to date, SN is collaborating with the Council of Europe, the Special Secretariat for the Protection of Unaccompanied Minors, and partner NGOs from Spain and the Netherlands for the implementation of an EU-funded project aiming to exchange good practices and propose improvements in the quality of support for migrant children during their transition to adulthood at European level. Trying to have uh, you know, our um, uh, services a bit uh, extended, we have recently also, also sent uh, a mission to Turkey to support the earthquake displaced uh, populations there by offering our know-how and uh, sending a team there to set up uh, child-friendly spaces in uh, the uh, area of the child protection services that we uh, offer. Um, so we would like to thank you for being here. We would like to also advise you, uh, if you want more info, to go on our we website. Donations are always welcome and uh, you, know, we, you can find everything there online. So uh, I hope everything goes well and thank you for being here. Uh, I cannot see yet online. Okay, uh, uh, we, we will re uh, recover the, the call with uh, um, the municipality of Tricala uh, later, uh, since we have a very packed <laughs> program. Uh, I will uh, present my short introduction. Other side. Okay, classic <laughs> computer problems. Okay. Um, so I will uh, not introduce uh, the project itself because we will have a presentation on the first. Uh, uh, on the first session uh, after the keynote speech that we talk about uh, the project. I will just uh, briefly mention what we expect from uh, this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, first, starting to discuss our results, 
on the table uh, uh, at the back corner, there are a few of the uh, paper products that we uh, made for our project and policy briefs uh, and stakeholder assessments and for consultation also uh, the, the, the first book that uh, uh, that uh, Gabriele Uchanti was mentioning uh, uh, before. Um, and uh, we'd like also to gain insights from other contexts. We are we have uh, partners from four uh, countries and uh, four uh, uh, small uh, and medium-sized towns from Belgium, Germany, Italy, and Greece. And we'd like also to see from other uh, to, to listen from other uh, other uh, uh, context, uh, and also to have a, a debate between uh, uh, among policymakers and and uh, uh, scholars that are interested in this uh, uh, in in this field. Uh, with the idea, and that's the final goal of our project, also to uh, both to support uh, the local decision makers and uh, to lobby uh, toward uh, upper scale uh, uh, decision makers to put uh, uh, small and medium sized towns on the map also uh, on, on migration policy. Uh, where are we heading? Uh, well, in the very short term, we are heading to Boyo in the sense that after the, uh, the conference, we will go to visit uh, our partner, uh, which is in the Kozani uh, region, not far from here. In relative terms. Uh, and uh, a bit later, we will go in September in Minove, which is uh, one of our, our other partners to, for our European policy platform. And uh, uh, then in Belgium again uh, in February for our final event. Uh, as for the outputs in the short term, we uh, aim to have a uh, 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 the proceedings uh, uh, in our uh, uh, university press series called the Media Towns, that is focused on, uh, on uh, migration in small towns. And, and uh, uh, in the midterm, we will uh, treasure from what we learn here uh, uh, to feed the um, big product that we are uh, we are to, uh, to uh, release at the end of the project, the white book on uh, um, migrants' participation in small and medium-sized towns. Uh, and uh, uh, in the long term, even though the title that make it not visible, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, also working on a uh, not strictly PISTA-related project uh, on uh, 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 co-editing a, a handbook uh, on uh, international migration in small towns and rural areas, in which we hope that uh, uh, many uh, of you are, uh, could be interested to contribute. And Ruth uh, McAvee, uh, which is uh, uh, here, and uh, Tiziana Caponio, and me will co edit this uh, book for uh, uh, Edward Elgar. And we, uh, we hope that it will be a good uh, scholarly uh, and not only uh, contribution. Um, some special thanks uh, to before uh, leaving the floor uh, to our keynote uh, uh, speaker. Uh, I'd like to thank my university also because they contributed financially to these events besides uh, the, the money uh, for, uh, for the project and all the staff uh, from the university that worked and in which you interacted a lot. <laughs> usually with the anonymous email of Pista at unirb.it and behind there was usually Athanasia and thanks for uh, for the uh, huge organizational contribution and all the other stuff that uh, partly is here, uh, partly not, but that contributed. And also thanks to Human Rights 360 and the Municipality of Voyo, uh, which are our partners in the project, uh, for the local uh, organization. Uh, finally, again, a special thanks to Solidarity uh, uh, Now, and uh, you can see the website there, and they already mentioned that you can also uh, uh, contribute to their effort if, uh, uh, if you like. Uh, finally, enjoy the event, this recommendation. We have a very, very, very uh, strict schedule, so 
uh, uh, take the time you have and no more than that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and follow us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and, and, uh, and on our website. So uh, I give now the floor uh, to uh, Ruth McEvity, which is our keynote speaker. Uh, she's a professor of sociology at Newcastle University, and uh, uh, she's, uh, she has a background in rural uh, sociology and rural studies. Uh, and she has worked on, uh, uh, she has been working on uh, how uh, rural areas do change uh, in, in Europe, and uh, uh, also uh, with an early interest on, on how migration is a part. Uh, of the change. So uh, I, I leave her the floor. Um, okay, wait, I, uh, I forgot to uh, put my presentation on. Okay. <laughs> so only people here could see it. I do not do the same method again. So, people in the back part, you say that they can't hear very well okay. so because there's the, the sound in the street. So, mm -hmm. you want to raise your voice so and I need yell to shout. if you want okay. a little bit. Okay. I was going to be lazy and set, but I think I should stand so I can. Whatever set. you prefer. Yeah. Okay. What do you want to say? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I will do my best to project my voice to the back of the room. So if you can't hear me, just raise your hand. Um, and I am really conscious of time, so I will try and do my best to stick to time and leave a little bit over for questions. Thank you very much, Eduardo and colleagues, for inviting me. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I've been in Thessaloniki a few times, so I was delighted to be able to come back and spend the weekend here before the conference. So as, um, as you've heard, I have been working on rural communities for a few decades, which makes me feel really old, but I've been working with rural communities thinking about a lot of things, social change, migration, agri-food systems for some time. And I'm going to talk today about issues that I know we're going to pick up on through the course of this afternoon and tomorrow morning. And I guess I just really want to caveat the talk that I'm going to give because I'm conscious that there's a lot of expertise in this room and I don't for one moment presume to um, make the claim that I know everything or um, I'm some sort of particular expert. Um, I would really like to provoke some discussion, make some comments and hopefully um, stimulate a bit of conversation over the course of the next um, two days. I, to some extent, I'm going to be, as it were, teaching my granny to suck eggs, talking about what has happened to small towns, medium towns, rural areas over this past while in the context of migration. Then I want to set the wider policy framework because I think that's important for understanding what actually happens um, in the sort of very micro spaces of everyday life. And then I will finish up by thinking about uh, wider conditions that foster a sense of belonging and mobilize benefits. And I'm thinking through the question of what we can do to stimulate and nurture belonging in the context of international migration to non-metropolitan um, spaces. And I'll come to the, back to that at the end. So we know that migration to these places, it's characterized by uh, diversity. Indeed, Stephen Vertebeck called it calls it super diversity because of the different types of flows that come to um, small towns and rural places and the, the medium towns that we're all focusing on. And people come from different routes, they have different motivations, they have different aspirations, they come with different baggages, with different experiences, different expertise. And I think that's really important to remember. And we've seen different waves of migration and thinking about the 
the Ireland and the UK context in the early 90s, we had quite a lot of labour migrants moving to take advantage of um, free movement in the EU. And then more recently in the 2010s, we've had more sort of refugees moving, fleeing different things. So it's really easy to talk about migrants, refugees and asylum seekers and to box people into those categories. And we know that that serves to allow us to make gross generalizations, but it also, I think, does something to the wider public. It obscures those sort of lived experiences. And I think that's important to remember. And particularly for me coming from a UK context where the right wing media is doing a really good job of making these sort of gross generalizations about individuals, which can serve to dehumanize what's actually happening to them and in their lives. So, we, I will be using some of those labels and the literature talks about, you know, how we really have this fetish for categorizing people. It serves some value, but I think we still need to remember that there's heterogeneity amongst these different groups and we need to think through what that means for individuals. So we know there are diverse contexts of reception and um, which I'll come back to um, in a little bit. But I think just understanding the wider uh, political science of migration, I think through that bigger context and the bigger picture. Um, Massey and colleagues talk about symbolic policy instruments that create an appearance of control. And we hear very sort of strong statements coming from policy makers, from government, um, about the actions that are going to be taken to overcome the so-called crisis of migration. And that can be really powerful, but it actually sometimes can create this discursive gap between what is said and what actually happens on the ground. And so we see political posturing around what might happen. So again, and apologies for drawing in the terrible case of the UK, but it's really close to the bone at the moment. And there's a lot of political posturing there at the moment. And um, some of you may have heard about the um, policy to return re refugees, people seeking asylum to Rwanda. Actually, nobody has been sent in that route. That is a lot of posturing. But there are still implications for the group of people who've been categorized and demonized in this way. And the research tells us that it's really unsettling and can be really um, disruptive for individual identities if they are categorized in this uh, de demonic way. So even with that posturing, even if it doesn't happen, there are costs at the individual level. Um, and I have shown here the example of the Swedish case where we had elections in the autumn time. And even there, the um, now the previous prime minister sort of center left postured around the actions that um, she would like to see if her government came back into power, talking about the fact that she didn't want Somali towns or China towns in Sweden. In fact, that no more than 50% of non-Nordic people should stay in any one housing area. So I think that's a really good example of that sort of um, political posturing and the sort of symbolic policy instruments that we see happening across uh, Europe today. And just to say in the wider, thinking through that wider uh, migration policy context, and we know that migration is governed through multi-level governance, which has implications because we can see sometimes at the very national level, that particular stance, but then we know at the very local level, local authorities, municipalities can push against, push back against that very negative um, rhetoric. So a really good, example is um, in the United States where we see different states with particular local ordinances that can have severe implications for migrants. So if you compare the state of Arizona with California, you see very different outcomes and context for reception of migrants. And migration is for sure a wicked problem. It can't really be solved by any single thing. There are really strong forces coming from multiple directions and in order to understand and think through policy instruments we need to understand that wider context of you know whether it's education housing the welfare state 
those wider sort of things will impact on migration. And I've talked about the strong policy narratives and those the political posturing. So politicians can, you know, keep repeating things, keep repeating things so that it nearly becomes normalized in lay discourse and in the publics and they start to believe certain things about migration. Um, I'm not really going to say anything about criminalization, securitization. We know that the tools that are used to uh, for policy in the criminal justice system have been sort of spilled over into immigration policy, criminalizing individuals who are uh, escaping hardship, war, escaping human rights abuses, etc. And I think one of the things that's really striking for me is how time is also used as a tool of oppression. And it's different for different categories of migrants. So if we think about individuals who are seeking, um, seeking asylum and they're waiting for their cases to be heard, time for many of them, and many that I've talked to in the Northeast of England and Newcastle, they're sitting in what are called um, refugee hotels and they're repurposed hotels and they're not like hotels. <laughs> But they're waiting, 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 and they're, you know, they have little control over their lives. And um, I think it's interesting, you know, we're in this um, centre here today, and they really grab on to things like conversation clubs that students at our university hold, and for the families, things like homework clubs and those sort of wider activities, because they're they're in this holding pattern, and you know, time is very, very oppressive for them. And then for individuals who are economic migrants working in the labour market, they really don't have enough time because they're working, working, working. And that means that they have limited time to become involved in civic society activities. And that can be um, really challenging. Um, you will all be familiar with this. This is um, the IOM sort of definition and understanding of integration. And I'm not really going to say much more on that because um, I'd rather get to some of the empirical uh, research. So the context and, you know, I think we'll be hearing quite a lot more about this today and tomorrow. The context for reception really differs across different spaces and it depends on many different things. And this is a, an image taken from uh, David Radford and colleagues project in Australia, where there's a very clear um, reaching out to um, attract refugees, migrants and new sectors into this community. So that's a context of depopulation and um, people, young people, especially moving out of rural Australia into the cities and the local municipalities recognize depopulation is something that they want to overcome and attracting migrants of different types into that community is um, seen as a positive thing. And then the reception can very much depend on other things like the availability, as you will know, of local services. What is the capacity? What is the expertise? And I know some of the work I did um, in the early noughties in Ireland, there, you know, Ireland typically both north and south has been until fairly recently a place of emigration. You know, what is to be Irish often is to get out of there, go to America, go to other places. Um, and that has certainly changed for the uh, Republic of Ireland, less so for the North. But as a result of less history of immigration, the local capacity to support new arrivals was very, very limited in terms of having adequate interpreters. And so there were lots of challenges for local communities because they didn't have the scope of the skills required. And, you know, I spoke to some families where they had children coming in to really serious medical appointments and translating and interpreting for them. So there's all sorts of practical challenges that you will all be familiar with. And um, Farinak Murtab talks about the importance of public spaces that are shared so that there's that sort of proximate space for the, if we call them the newcomers and the, the long-standing communities to interact and to get to know each other, that can be really powerful and important. And in rural communities and in medium towns, small towns, there tends to be fewer public spaces, but they um, bring people together and that can help um, a lot. And then we know that the context of reception 
as well, positive outcomes can happen where there's a full community approach. And it's really nearly like an implicit recognition of the fact that migration is a wicked problem and it needs this kind of wider holistic approach from different parts of the community, whether it's local businesses, municipalities, third sector organizations, if they can come together and um, support each other, then there can be really positive outcomes. And I've seen this in many towns in Ireland where there was a groundswell of movement and a really sort of an explicit um, move to welcome people into the, the community and to make it work for them and to put particular resources in so that um, they had a positive experience. So this is a case study and um, just really short one to highlight how context and um, the experiences vary depending on the types of individuals, the types of migrants that we're talking about. So I did some work with mushroom pickers and um, orchard workers in Northern Ireland just before the pandemic in 2019. You know, and this was a really, it was an interesting case because I've been doing quite a lot of research previously with very, very highly qualified Eastern European migrants that had made a move permanently with their families to moved to different parts of Ireland and they wanted to stay there. They settled, their families you know, were in school and um, they really ha had their foot very firmly um, in Irish. So I limited contact and connections back home, but they were staying in Ireland. Um, a different wave of migrants moved in the 2010s um, and many of them were from Bulgaria and Romania. Many of them were not literate in their own language and they barely knew where they were. Um, and, you know, we have the border and some of them were moving across the border. They didn't really understand necessarily that there were different contexts there, which is particularly more relevant now in a context of Brexit. But they moved to um, this place where there was a little bit of depopulation, but the housing stock, the housing quality was really poor and they moved into poor quality housing where sometimes there wasn't even running water, electricity was a problem. And I remember somebody describing how the water was running down the wall and they turned the light on and they got an electric shock. So, you know, it really housing not fit for purpose. But they were really very much as Pure described um, in the late 70s, wage earners. So they were there, they were, and um, they had working in the mushroom plants was a means to an end. So they were very much about trying to develop their children's language skills, get them through an education. And that was their objective. And although some of them did say that their lives were pretty, pretty bad, they didn't have much of a life because they were working all the time. They were doing it um, in order to get their kids through the education. And they retained very strong connections back home and got excuses from back home. So, you know, I think that's kind of interesting in a context of thinking through if migration is permanent or not. Do you want, do we need to do anything? Think, please, what are you doing? Okay. <laughs> um, so place matters differently for different categories of migrants. And for these migrants that I spoke to, they didn't really care where they were and they weren't interested in making those connections out into the community. And they had separate churches, separate social spaces. Um, their lives were in fact parallel to the, the, the rest of the population. And it worked both ways. There was little desire to find the local population to bring them into wider social networks. So just to say on um, refugees and asylum seekers, and I think because of the, um, the policy re rhetoric around a lot of people seeking asylum, there can be a tendency to dehumanize and to separate ourselves from refugees and asylum seekers. And I think that is a very explicit desire amongst certain quarters in society you know, and it's it's easy then if we're sort of banding a group of people as a threat to society to forget that they've actually been through trauma. They have been fleeing persecution and fleeing all sorts of things. And, you know, 
it is forced migration. It's not something necessarily that they have chosen to do. Um, and we see in some systems, and certainly it's the case in the UK system, a hierarchy of worth amongst different categories of asylum seekers. So we have for um, people seeking asylum from Hong Kong and from the Ukraine, they're able to work. All other asylum seekers are not able to work and they get afforded completely different rights and they get access to different parts of the welfare system. So, you know, that hierarchy of rights is quite um, damaging for social relations and for individual sense of worth. If we have Syrian refugees, for instance, who feel that they, they really want to work, they all of them want to work and they can't and they see the Ukrainians being treated in a different way. Um, and, you know, I think uh, Charles Taylor puts it well, talking about the disruption to identity. And he describes how real damage and distortion can happen if people or society are on the mirror back to them, a demeaning or contemptible picture of themselves. And I think we see that happening in some sort of higher level discourse in society, which of course then can be pushed back against at the very local level. So just to think through a little bit about belonging um, and belonging, it's really clear that there are a range of different factors that influence how our, our own sense of belonging. And so we can draw from um, relations with other people. So belonging doesn't happen in isolation from social relations. It is relational um, and it's through interactions with others. And an individual's personal experience, their history can influence the degree to which they are able to belong. And obviously there are other factors there as well, legal, economic, and you know, that the sort of economic belonging, can somebody work? Are they able to integrate or embed in the labor market? That's um, really important. And the literature also shows how new surroundings are particularly important for refugee settlement. And that's sort of both the, the very physical um, environment, but the sort of the, the more symbolic environment and the sense to which individuals feel that they're wanted in a society. We also know from the literature that belonging increases if people have a real sense of ease with themselves and their surroundings. And I have talked and I've spoken to refugees who have described how if they're in the city, they really don't feel relaxed and they feel that they're constantly um, on high alert because they feel that somebody might challenge them that they're not they're supposed to be there or maybe don't want to take a photograph because they feel that um, they're going to be questioned by just general uh, members of the public. So, you know, they don't have a sense of being at ease in that context. And Miller talks about the quintessential mode of being human, um, which all aspects of the self are perfectly integrated, a mode of being in which we are as we ought to be fully ourselves. And I think there are very real questions there about how we can nurture that sense of belonging. And some um, research in regional Australia sort of talks about belonging as both a feeling and a practice. So it's back to this kind of relational thing of belonging it's you know how you feel about yourself but it's also the, the um your lived experience and what you do on a daily basis and i should say these are pictures taken um from what that um i've been doing with a colleague in newcastle bringing people seeking asylum and um refugees into the national park in the northeast of england so there's a really famous hadrian's wall which some of you may have heard of um, it was celebrating 1900 years last year. So we did some, some walks with refugees, taking them out into that green space. So that's what the photos are in the slides. Um, and so belonging is very much about familiarity and ease with the world that you live in and understanding. I mean, I think this is what's really important about work of third sector organizations, helping um, migrants to understand the sort of social norms of the place that they're in and I think it's interesting the list of questions in the um one of the leaflets we got today from 
the, the centre here talking about, you know, do you know how to get your kids in school? Do you know where to get where the pharmacy is? Do you, you know, those practical things. But I think also then if people are coming into centres like this, they will learn about the wider sort of cultural norms, the social practices. And, you know, that imbues a sense of belonging because people do feel much more um, relaxed. But, you know, the, the question of what belonging means from a political perspective, I think is, is really important and is really powerful for individuals and how the multi-level governance influences that sense of belonging. And we have material and symbolic aspects. So it's, it's not just about, you know, having those sort of on starting to understand the cultural norms. Fundamentally, people, um, at least in my experience, do want to work. They want to have that sort of belonging to the labor market, which allows them, um, it facilitates their belonging in other parts of society, in civil, civil society, in neighborhoods. And, Home, in fact, the literature tells us as well, and belonging, home and belonging can be a bundle of contradictions because it can generate those feelings of safety, belonging, security, but also it can be a site of violence, oppression, alienation. And if people are fleeing something, then they've fled those sort of feelings from their home place. So there's a bit of a sort of paradox going on. And I think if we're trying to nurture that sense of belonging, it's about creating those spaces of safety, belonging and connection. I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, so I'm conscious of time and I will just say a few more things. All right, so one of the things that I think is really important and really comes through in current literature, current projects, is the importance of both anchor institutions and community leaders. And I, the whole sort of um, categorization of organizations as anchor institutions comes from urban um, literature, urban regeneration literature, where typically it was the EDS and MEDS, it's called, so it's sort of universities, hospitals, as big contributors to the local economy. Um, but in a, in a more sort of non sort of metropolitan context in the context of small towns, medium towns, there can be a network of organizations that are really critical for building up that support structure for um, migrants. And they often fill in the gaps that have been left in um, a context of either austerity or smaller states and the state not um, providing services in the way that it did in the past. And I think anchor institutions can facilitate sticky knowledge. So they are, um, they become very active, active through community leaders who share knowledge, share information. And that idea of the whole community approach really comes through if there's a dense network of um, anchor institutions. And in places with very, um, with, with those anchor institutions, there's a really powerful sense of identity. And I know that in some places that I have worked with, I have spoken to local councillors and they talked about how they got local businesses together, third sector organisations, the local government, and they all worked together to try and create that sense of belonging and to reach out to newcomers in the community. So the final, um, Thing I just want to raise um, as a sort of conversation point for this afternoon and for tomorrow is this idea of the role for green therapies. So this is Hadrian's Wall. Um, and the environmental psychology literature talks about how individuals who are forced to flee, that even years after they have fled, they report missing neighborhoods, mountains, oceans, years after that. And bringing people into green spaces can help to overcome, it can help to start to fill that gap and pivot them into the future so that they're starting to make roots in the places where they're existing. And losing those attachments, especially for people um, who've experienced forced migration is really disruptive and stressful. So bringing people in, into these um, natural environments can help to overcome some of that stress. And the literature also talks about health benefits 
from being in places that are particularly beautiful, that have got high heritage or landscape value. And so I've been doing work with an artist practitioner bringing people out. And this is another um, project that one of my PhD students has done bringing refugees from the city out into a forest park and um, just spending time there. And because, you know, a lot of people seeking asylum in the UK, they basically get eight pounds a week and that's it. And like, you can't do anything on eight pounds a week. So it's, they, they don't have the transport, they don't have the means to get out into the um, countryside. So we see misrepresentation and misrecognition of individuals as they are categorized in different ways and they are assigned different social worth in um, society. And I think creating a sense of belonging is fundamentally about, well, it's fundamentally about questions of human rights, but it's about creating fair, just relations um, across all spheres of society. And I'm pretty much done. I'm going to leave it there, apart from saying that, you know, as we think through these issues, I think time is complex and it's different for different groups of people. And that can really impact on mental well being and a capacity to develop and to belong in a place, which, you know, if we're not encouraging people to belong, then we're not really um, releasing the sort of benefits to the receiving society. And I think we can think through the, the, the role of anchor institutions, local government and community leaders. And finally, um, the natural environment and those sort of interconnections between different types of urban and rural spaces can be really powerful for helping to nurture a sense of belonging. So I'm gonna leave it there and I hope Thank I haven't you. run over too much. Now with the first uh, session. Glad to is, uh, is uh, to be everything in order to start the first session. Uh, my name is Dave Austin, and I'm one of the anchor partners in the district project that I was asked to chair. This session is a really tough task. We have one hour and four presentations. <laughs> we really took some minutes of that, so I'm not going to eat too much in an already very short coffee break. So we have four presentations. I'm just going to quickly present them and then leave it up to the speakers, of course, to take as much time as possible. The first. Paper is uh, Fabio De Blasis and Federico Rossi. I think Fabio is here with us. Um, and uh, Fabio is, uh, he holds a PhD in Global International Studies from the University of Bologna. And he has conducted a lot of research on international migration, on labor migration, and migration policies in the countries of origin, in the transit countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in the countries of destination in Europe. And he's currently a researcher in the University of Bologna. And so he's going to present on the incorporation and the participation of migrants in Poland. Reasons, reasons, science funds, and he's going to present and look at it right away. He's ready. He's going to present some insight from the FISTA project. So, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Fabio de Blasis. Um, I'm working on the PISTA project as a research fellow at the University of Urbino. And uh, Federico um, is a PhD candidate, Federico Rossi, 
at the University of Rubino Carlo Po, but you couldn't join us today. Uh, so I'll be briefly uh, introducing the project and then uh, um, I'll introduce the context of the research and some preliminary findings. Um, how do we move here? Okay. Okay. Uh, well, PISA is funded by the uh, Asylum Migration and Integration Fund of the European Union and aims at um, promoting the participation of migrants uh, in the uh, design, uh, um, implementation, and evaluation of uh, incorporation policies at the local level, uh, especially in, mid, in a small and mid sized town. Um, well, the partnership is composed of three academic institutions, an NGO and four municipalities located in four uh, European countries, uh, Belgium, Germany, Greece, uh, and uh, Italy. Um, we are adopting different met methods and methodologies, uh, including uh, preliminary research, uh, national and local level on regulatory frameworks regarding the incorporation and participation. And we are uh, conducting field works uh, for each um, in each municipality, uh, we have conducted focus groups and about thirty interviews for each for each uh, field. Um, we are also discussing these fundings uh, through policy platforms at the local and the European level with um, key uh, policymakers and stakeholders. Um, we are in the process of um, developing co-writing workshops uh, with local uh, stakeholders on, on participation uh, practices and policies. Uh, and the four municipalities, municipalities will be um, undertaking some policy experiments uh, in, in, each, in each field. Um, we have published already a report about um, regulatory frameworks and local uh, integration networks, as well as policy briefs uh, at national and European level. Um, and we are in the process of working on a white book, white paper, uh, providing some suggestions to, to municipalities, to small and medium sized municipalities. Um, okay, let's move to, the, uh, to our context. Um, You, as you can see, the municipalities involved are uh, Bebra in Germany, Firmignano in Italy, uh, Ninov in Belgium, and uh, Boyo in Greece. Um, as you can see, they differ a bit in terms of sites, ranging from 8,000 uh, inhabitants in Firmignano up to uh, almost 40,000 in, in Ninov. Uh, and they also differ a bit in terms of uh, migrant presence, immigration rate, um, with Boyo uh, showing the lowest immigration rate and Bebra and Feminiano, uh, an immigration rate above um, 10%. Um, um, as you can see, they have different um, history and patterns of, of migration. Um, Bebra and Feminiano have more uh, experience, let's say, with, with migration, especially uh, labor migration since uh, decades, let's say, while Nino and Boyo have a more recent relation with migrants and, 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 migra and migration. Um, they also differ in terms of diversity, internal diversity of migration. Um, I'm quickly moving, as we don't have much time, to some uh, main, uh, main, main fundings. Um, which we find there are some challenges and opportunities uh, recurring in our for, for um, case studies, which we think are relevant for, for local policy making and participation, political participation. Uh, just a quick note on po political participation. We, we, we understood politi political participation as uh, in a broader way, uh, meaning all the, the ways through which uh, needs are made public with intention of uh, influencing policy making at the local level. Um, here we have some interlinked dimensions. Um, I'm not, I'll just say a few words on, on, on some of them. 
as, as some topics will be also, also discussed later. Um, so what, what, what matters in our uh, small and medium-sized towns? A lot of things, uh, but basically, um, obviously local politics and political sensitivity to migration uh, related issues uh, matters. The political orientation of local governments uh, obviously plays a role in the local migration, migration governance. And it is, this is also the case for, uh, for the creation of participation opportunities uh, for migrants at the local level. Um, our case studies also tell us that um, the also the level of conflict around migration, for example, the strong presence of far right party in, in, the, in the municipal council uh, also matter for, for, for participation policies uh, and practices. Uh, we will we'll have a presentation on Inof and Permo, I think, later on uh, on this. Um, and this is also linked to the um, histories and patterns of, of migration um, that are related also to the degree of centrality and marginality within national borders of, of this, these towns, um, meaning that the geographical position of the towns shapes uh, migration pattern and consequently the space for migrants to participate in the local policy making arena. Um, for example, in peripheral places such as uh, or, or transit places such as Voyo, uh, but also in places that are close to larger uh, urban areas like Nino, um, where migrants regularly commute to, to Brussels, uh, it is more difficult to, to, to involve uh, migrants to establish relations at institutional level. Um, while in places of more settlement of migration, let's say, as uh, Pebra and Perpignano, there is a more favorable context, let's say. Um, another recurring uh, element in our case study concerned the, the capacity of, of, the, of the local government to, to implement policies, incorporation and participation policies, and and uh, the, the availability of local resources and skills also matter, um, which we know that in, in, in small contexts is, is often very much limited. Um, indeed, the, the, the lack of institutional capacity uh, is perhaps one of, one of the most pressing challenge, challenges for, for, for our uh, local contexts to develop strategies for, for migrants uh, incorporation and, and participation, even though there is uh, a variation um, understand to which towns, towns can rely on, on, on higher uh, policy level for fundings, for example. Um, and it is in this, in this sense, it was also worth mentioning, I think that um, while um, integration policies of, often uh, arise within social uh, and welfare departments, uh, we see also some attempts to, to move from a welfare perspective, let's say, to, to a more transversal. Uh, perspective, um, and this um, can also be observed when looking at um, some um, the history of some tools uh, for political participation at the level that are uh, available. Um, meaning that in all four cases, the regulatory frameworks provides for provide for uh, the possibility to establish some tools for for participation, advisory council, adjunct uh, councillors, uh, etc. Um, but in some cases have been established, in other cases they have not been established, um, such as in Voglio and Fermignano, they have not been established for different reasons. Uh, for example, in Fermignano, they are considered outdated. <laughs> okay. Um, um, in other cases, they have been implemented, but for example, in Bebra, uh, there is an advisory council since the early 90s, but then it was transformed into something different. Um, the, the role of civil society organization, third sector actors, um, trade unions is also uh, important at the local level. Um, in all contexts, third sector actors, civil society organization are providing some sort of services uh, to migrants. And in, we see them in smaller contexts uh, with a limited number of actors and sometimes overlapping roles um, between the private and the public. Um, they may have a significant role in, in uh, making the voice of migrants heard at the local level, um, especially when there is the presence of migrants within this, this organization. Um, but of course, also the presence of migrants association, religious association at the local level uh, matter. 
uh, although in our cases they are not present in all, in all towns. Um, for example, in Boyo there is no migrant association, well, where in, in Bevra uh, there is a more established network of association also because of the history and trajectories of migration, but also um, it is also related to the extent to which uh, municipalities support this kind of association. Uh, they rarely receive any kind of institutional financial support, uh, perhaps with the exception of, of Termignano. Um, individuals also play a role uh, at the local level in our case studies, um, acting as bridging figures uh, that establish relationships and links between migrant communities and local administration and, and other and local networks of integration. Um, they are usually people with immigrant background uh, with a role in the public administration on, in key third sector organization. Um, for example, the town of Nino has a sort of active policies, policy on, on, on bridging figure, uh, meaning that is investing in so-called outreach social workers that are trying to link, to reach newly arrived migrants and to link them to, to the administration and to, to the local network uh, of services. Um, while in Bebra and Ferminiano, they are less institutionalized, let's say, but you can still find that uh, those figures among, uh, for example, municipal councillors, public servants employed in, in public services, uh, key representatives of migrants association or voluntary association. Um, it is also worth mentioning here that um, while the commitments of some individuals um, may actually um, help in, 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 in making the, the voice of migrants heard, uh, there is also a potential risk that um, individual-based relation um, and established network around these individuals will, will be lost when the, the local bridging figure uh, disappear. And there is also a risk that um, um, some migrant communities may actually remain ex excluded from the network uh, that are created by these individuals. Um, and this is, this is also the case of the last issue I would like to, to conclude with, um, which is something related to the case of Fermignano specifically, meaning the, the, the rise of, of uh, let's say, migration policy and entrepreneurs uh, arising from, from such, within such bridging figures that I just mentioned. Um, well, policy entrepreneurs are usually defined as those uh, individuals that are able to, to drive policy change uh, by building up consensus, uh, advocacy coalitions, uh, and eventually by uh, securing funds uh, to implement certain pilot projects. And we think that in the case of Fermignano, we can, uh, such figure may, may be uh, identified um, in, the, in a municipal councillor of foreign origin, which was uh, elected in 2016 and then in 2021. And that the small context also has some peculiarities uh, included the, the limited institutional capacity that can leave uh, space for, for the for, of action for to, to policy entrepreneurs. Um, how much time I have left? One minute. Okay. Uh, this is the map of local network in, in, in Fermignano. And um, um, you see that there is a limited number of actors uh, operating the integration services and, and, and policies, let's say. Uh, but then if we, if, we look, if we look at individuals within this organization, we understand how uh, the, the, the boundaries between the public and the private, uh, it's not so, so clear. For example, the, the, uh, one of the founders of the Albanian Association is also employed in the local immigration office. Uh, the president of uh, volunteer organization, Il Bacello, was a former municipal councillor. And also the Islamic community has strong links with the municipalities, uh, thanks to the municipal councillor, which was elected mostly with votes from, from that community. Um, um, here we have five main uh, key findings and recommendations uh, from our European policy brief. I'm not going uh, to that, maybe we'll be discussing later. <laughs> and anyway, you can find some I think we have some policy briefs there, so if you want to consult. Um, well, thank you. I'm done.
for a She's going to talk about uh, migra migration in a small post-colonial town from Pisa to Pisa. Yeah, it's yeah. a, a small municipality which is at the triple border of Bulgaria, Greece, and Turkey. Uh, when you are here, it moved. When you are not here, I do not <laughs> so that it needs you here. Okay, if you like to say <laughs> Harmony does not need to travel because the whole world passes through harmony. Can you speak up a little bit? <clears throat> if I start with the quote from a local poet, it is because it presents in a very nice way how place, space of places and space of laws are interconnected not only in the poetic imaginary of the small town of Harmanli, but also in the local identity where we see places, connectivity, globalization, and belonging are interconnected. I will not detail so that I will discuss this small town at the triple border of Bulgaria, Greece, and uh, uh, Turkey, Turkey. Uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, a result of another Horizon 2020 project, so bridging project, uh, you know, is uh, the new uh, uh, policy of the European Commission, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, very, uh, yes, very nice. Okay, so mm, there are some problems with the, uh, the presentation. So the migration profile uh, could, could be uh, uh, summarized uh, um, in, uh, let's say, two regards. So first, with a very <clears throat> brusque, in a way, transition from no migration, almost zero migration, to uh, quite important, let's say, for the local scale flows, uh, and uh, yeah, so that uh, you do not see the, uh, uh, yeah, the left part of the presentation, but uh, uh, okay. And so <clears throat> what we see today are relatively small, but diverse types of uh, uh, migration, family migration, uh, mainly it is a very specific, uh, so mainly women, uh, mainly from uh, Russia and uh, some post-communist, uh, uh, some post-Soviet uh, uh, countries, uh, yeah, uh, which have families uh, with the uh, Bulgarian uh, Cubans. Uh, uh, there is a new refugee center. It will be, it will play an important role in the presentation. In mainly in the surrounding villages, but very connected to the small town, uh, we uh, encounter uh, um, Westerners, expats, mainly from UK. There are some representatives of UK, so that uh, who really appreciate uh, uh, the climate, uh, the nice uh, conditions there. And there are a few entrepreneurs, uh, mainly from uh, Greece and uh, uh, Turkey, as well as uh, uh, some of the, uh, uh, of the migrants. So just to summarize, always mission impossible to summarize everything in 10 uh, minutes, but small towns have a very special place in the migration profile of Bulgaria. Bulgaria, you all know, 
is an immigration country, so Bulgarians have been <laughs> already presented as immigrants in your countries. Uh, it is a recent post-communist immigration country, which still, okay, does not change the whole profile, but this relatively recent and not very important immigration is concentrated in the capital and in the big cities. And there is this new phenomenon, uh, really more recent, the last decade, uh, uh, probably uh, uh, expects uh, from the UK to Japan, uh, which is really numerically not important, but uh, it is uh, symbolically very, uh, very interesting because they come from much more developed countries, uh, uh, etc. And so the small towns are between between, uh, uh, and it is also a new object of study, which make it, uh, makes it really uh, challenging. <laughs> the conceptual cluster um, is uh, rich, <laughs> and I'll summarize it very briefly, uh, so that I'll take uh, this uh, insightful triad uh, of uh, bordering, uh, not only because uh, the town is at a border, it's a triple border, because, but uh, because uh, uh, it is a really, uh, a very, uh, a very insightful uh, bordering over construction of borders, bordering uh, uh, over construction of alternative of differences, and ordering. Uh, there is a place of everybody, but everybody should stay in his her uh, place. And uh, uh, I'm really sorry why the presentation looks so it is uh, more beautiful, uh, <laughs> uh, not deformed, so that here um, it is really deformed, uh, uh, so that uh, the conceptual cluster combines, of course, most cities with remoteness, bordering, re de bordering all those uh, processes plus crisis. crisis uh, is a major uh, concept uh, uh, in uh, uh, in the presentation. So migration, uh, migrations, and the crisis, everything in plural. So crisis, I'll take three of them. We have more, uh, but <laughs> I'll take three of them, which are uh, crucial. So crisis of communism, uh, which is a nice in a way because okay, so it was the beginning of post communism, migration crisis, and uh, uh, COVID. I take them for a topic we share very much so that the temporality, I prefer the temporality, which is the social experience and cultural experience of time because of it intense temporality so that the things get, let's say, more evident, uh, et cetera, because it is also very much a threshold and the change uh, which becomes uh, uh, visible and also because I conceptualize uh, it in a okay, relatively innovative way, classic, uh, what I understand, classic understanding and a new type of uh, 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 crisis. So, <clears throat> Mission Impossible, let's say, to, in one slide, let's say, to summarize the communist and the post communist, uh, uh, let's say, a uh, 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 bordering. So, communism is, uh, um, could be summarized in the paradox. Efficient migration policy and no migration. Very efficient and political scientists, my students do know. Effective policy is the one which achieves its goal. The goal was to create both society, not emigration, not immigration. It was largely achieved. So Bordering, yes. Afa, oh my God, five minutes. I'm at the real beginning. Okay. So, emigration, thank you very much for the support. Okay, for post communist. Post communist comes, okay, so the country opens, uh, 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 etc., but still a lot of crisis. How did Bulgarian citizens, as well as several East European citizens, respond? It? let's say, to the new crisis, the inefficiency of the new elites, et cetera, in three ways. Migration, migration, migration. So huge emigration at the beginning. Uh, I skipped that, <laughs> so that I will skip a lot of things, et cetera. Migration, so second crisis, migration, uh, uh, also um, <clears throat> uh, migration crisis, and migration is a shock. Migration as such shock arrived to this small city, which is also the reason to study it, with the construction of a refugee center. 
So all interviewees, they share that overnight, the situation in the country, in the chain, because it, especially at the beginning, so the number, okay, so the imaginary also increased this number very much, but still it was more or less one fourth of the population. So in a small town with no migration, really overnight to have, let's say 25, 30% of the population migrants coming from <laughs> very much other, other uh, in the public imagination of the countries without, let's say, yeah, previous uh, connections, etc. It was lived, uh, 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 let's say, as a show. No need to say to you, this small town is a paradise for all populists. <laughs> all populist parties, they start their campaign there. <laughs> It is easy for us to say, and we do know, let's say the result, but the result is there extremely performative, not at local level, but at national level discourse, which produces realities, which produces realities. This performative uh, uh, discourse is that when it is their sociologists here, Ruth Brilliant sociologists among them. When people are asked in a survey, how many percent there are the immigrants in Bulgaria? They respond 11%. In Bulgaria, the percentage of immigrants is less than two, less than two. From less than two to 11, this is, production of a new bo body politics, and who produces that? Those nationalist leaders, which like this small city so much, and they produce the reality, it is not only in the, uh, in the polls, it is a reality because they vote for them, and uh, it is a cycle, I'm a political scientist, I could expect. Triple migration crisis, triple rebordering, sensed wars to bridge with the root, symbolic policy instruments for creating appearance of control, fence created, built in Bulgaria. It does not protect, I normally choose another one where refugees pass it, but I ask the question, what do fences borders do if they do not protect? My answer is, they do so many things that I call it magic of borders, but I need another, let's say, conference to present refugee care, populist othering, etc. Just here, let's say, okay, to compare and to, to introduce this new understanding of crisis, which allows us to really better understand the situation, which is, I summarize it in a provocative, let's say, thesis I uh, 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 published already. If the migration crisis did not exist, it would have been invented by populist leaders. You recognize Sartre? If the Jews did not exist, they would have been invented by anti-Semitism. So nationalist populists today, not only in this small city and in the small country of Bulgaria, but everywhere, they need migration crisis in such an intimate and deep way as anti-Semitic needed Jews, etc. And open these two types of crisis, etc. So give me another <laughs> let's say flow to present them. One minute, let me see. <laughs> Let us see what to do, uh, uh, et cetera. Just to say that, of course, let's say COVID is the opposite, so that attracting uh, not new migrants, but mainly returnees, uh, uh, et cetera, to the country. So migration and citizenship, so to go <laughs> to leave the crisis and to uh, create, uh, let's say, uh, uh, to present uh, the, the, po the positive side. So the first, uh, uh, the first positive side, 
beneficiary, who benefits mainly in economic terms from this city, the new refugee center. Local population, because this is one of the major employers in the town, because it also attracts highly qualified labor force, et cetera, et cetera. So that a lot of uh, yeah, benefits really economic for the local population, let's say because, let's say of this uh, uh, refugee, uh, refugee policy. I'll skip that. Everyday bordering. Uh, I met so many times, but for the first time I have the pleasure and the honor to listen to Root. Uh, so many ideas, green therapy. Unfortunately, I have no time to include it here, but one of the participatory ideas, which okay, I and my team introduced is called intercultural gardens as green bridges. In all schools with refugee and migrant children, in the town and the villages, we introduced this idea so that all children, parents, teachers, scholars, etc., we planted together different, okay, so but there are, there are several cultural symbolic dimensions in that, because with the idea not so much of therapy, but really this greening of the self, greening not of solidarity, but the greening of our responsibility that for nature, there are no ages, there are no genders, that we are all together in our responsibility to nature. Everybody adored that. And just one, one of these, uh, uh, let's say, innovations, which is a play school, a young British lady after Oxford and Cambridge settled for existential reasons in this small town and introduce, let's say an idea she knew of course and not invented by her, the play school. So for newly arriving kids, let's say this play uh, therapy, um, which allows to work with the kids uh, with different languages, uh, which she does not know. Etc. And this is a general uh, interview, really something new, let's say, to the Bulgarian uh, civil society initiative, which is self funded. In internet, please fund the teacher, uh, only that. There is no state behind, there are no, internet, there are no international organizations, there are no local NGOs who support her, just the internet donors, etc. Concluding remarks, uh, I, uh, uh, I will not uh, present them. <laughs> I will finish just with the image, which is the favorite of my students. So how fences become flight and empowerment, if I can get to the end of my presentation, which, uh, okay, this is, thank you very much. Uh, next presentation is by Lucia uh, Maria Fazia. I didn't receive a publicity of you. So I'm not going to tell you a uh, lot about Lucia uh, Maria, but she's from Tokyo University in Greece. And she will tell us about the uh, social spatial trajectories of Bangladeshi migrants in a small town and rural uh, localities in Greece. Huh? Okay, yes, I didn't see it.
Thank you. So I'm Lucia Maria Fratea, I'm a researcher at Harakopi University in Athens in, in Greece here. And in this presentation, uh, I draw upon uh, current research we are implementing in the Department of Geography at Harakopi University with Professor Papadopoulos. And uh, this presentation aims to analyze the different social and spatial mobility trajectories of Bangladesh migrants in Greece, and to see their employment and social mobility strategies for improving their livelihoods and well-being in the country. So let me start by saying that although migrant social mobility has long been part of sociological discussions of both sides of the Atlantic, there is a recent academic debate in investigating the social and spatial mobility of migrants and while earlier sterilizations were bound to the boundaries of the nation states, so investigating social mobility within a specific country, recent discussions uh, build upon transnationalism and mobility and acknowledging that it's possible for migrants to be simultaneously embedded and moving in different social and spatial contexts. What it is important for our discussion here is that migrants may hold a dual frame of reference. So, from the perspective of the country of origin, migrants may experience social mobility if we measure it in terms, for example, income or consumption patterns, but their social standing in the destination uh, country may be in the lower parts of the occupational hierarchy. Now, it is important thus to examine what Khalil argues the full course of the journey, to see migration processes from the origin country to the country of the destination, and also to see the different transformative mobilities and their connections and the way urban and rural uh, interactions generate new types of mobility. And also, as mobility uh, is also an aspiration to move forward, examine also the aspirations, but also the capabilities of migrants to remain to urban or rural areas is equally important. Now, turning the discussion to Bangladeshi migration in Greece, Bangladeshi migration in Greece is rather a recent phenomenon and a relative neglected issue in the Greek literature. The vast majority of the Greek migration research turns towards Albanian migration, which is the most numerous uh, migrant nationality in the country. As the Italian case, there are no prior colonial or religious ties which would partially explain the development of Bangladeshi community in Greece. Uh, from the late 1990s onwards, Bangladeshi migration in Greece is increasing. In 2001 population census, there was around 5,000 Bangladeshi migrants living in the country. This figure doubled in the 2011 population census. And now Bangladeshis are the, most, the second most numerous South Asian nationality following Pakistani migrants in Greece. Now, there are several issues concerning the characteristics of Bangladeshi migration in Greece. First, Bangladeshi migration in Greece is male dominated. So contrary to the previous uh, presentation, the proportion of uh, female Bangladeshi migrants in Greece is relatively low, even if we see it with, uh, in terms of population census or in terms of legal permits. Uh, Equally, an important issue that is almost half of Bangladeshi migrants in the country are married. However, their family tend to remain the country of origin. Uh, their educational profile is relatively low to average. 5% of Bangladeshi migrants hold tertiary education. But more importantly, for uh, the vast majority, the language proficiency, the Greek language proficiency re is relatively poor. And this also places issue in terms of occupational uh, mobility, but also challenges the participation of the formal labor market. Uh, the majority of Bangladeshi migrants are employed. Entrepreneurship is high. And the majority is employed in the service sector, mainly in tourism services. In the secondary sector, in urban places, we are talking about the garment industry and the rural areas in the food processing industry. 
and a good number of Bangladeshi migrants working, as we will see, in the agriculture, in particular in the, agri in the intensive agricultural sector. However, in uh, respect of the economic sector, the vast majority of Bangladeshi migrants are employed in the so-called low status occupation. Now, another important issue is that Bangladeshi migration in Greece is steadily increasing. So if we look from 2012 onwards, then uh, the number of valid residence permits of Bangladeshi migrants in Greece are uh, almost doubled. But this is not to say that uh, there are no issues because half to more than half of the Bangladeshi community in Greece uh, lives in the irregular status, status. And this also places issues in terms of participation in the public sphere, participation in the labor market. And the final point is that the spatial distribution of Bangladesh migrants is interesting. So they are mainly uh, concentrated in the Attica region, in Athens, and in Western Greece, which is the west part of the Peloponnese, and particularly in two regional units, Ahaia Ilia, where uh, there's an expansion in the last years of strawberry cultivation, and Bangladesh migrants work in the intensive uh, strawberry cultivation in that area. Now, in our research, we did interviews with 21 Bangladeshi migrants, uh, with most of them in two occasions between 2017 and 2021. Uh, participants' age range from 28 to 49 years old, and we pay attention to include participants with diverse demographic profile. Our interviews were conducted in Athens and in Western Greece, particularly Manolada uh, area. And these two research sites, Athens and Western Greece are not treated as isolated, but rather they are seen as interconnected. And we see two mobility interconnections between two these two places. First, migrants may arrive directly either to Athens or in Western Greece, or during their lifetime, they move, move between these two places. For example, they may live to, in Athens and in harvesting season, they may move to Western Greece to increase the, their income. Now, in their interviews with Bangladeshi migrants, we may identify three occupational trajectories. When Bangladeshis arrive in rural places, uh, particularly in Western Greece, agriculture is the sector of arrival. So they seek, because they don't know the language, they don't have paper, agriculture is the main place we can find, they can find employment. And after they have the uh, opportunity to legalize the status, to learn the Greek language, they advance either within the agricultural sectors or they move out to move on. They move to a uh, garment industry and they try to move uh, within the garment uh, industry. Other participants started with precarious jobs or street vendors and move into tourism or service sectors. In any case, uh, starting one, on one business is an important strategy to improve the occupational uh, status. However, there's no linear transition between the, the occupations. So Bangladeshi don't move from one job, uh, from one job to a better one. And uh, in some cases, they prefer uh, to, to go to a lower status occupational uh, position in order to have the ability to send money to their families and thus hold this kind of image of a successful breadwinner to uh, the community back in Bangladesh. So in the next couple of slides, I will just uh, show some trajectories of our Bangladeshi participants. So Nobel's trajectory, uh, the early phases of his migration is what we call in the literature stepwise migration. He moves from country to country and he accumulates the necessary financial capital in order to finance the next step of his journey. So he was, what he was, was born in a village in Sitagon. He decides to move away from this kind of low paid job. And he first moved to India and then to Pakistan. After 12 years working in Karachi in the garment industry, he resumed his mobility plant and moved to Iran to take it. For him, Turkey was a transit place just to gather, to meet a group, smuggler, to be able to cross the border. He arrived in Athens in 2009. He didn't have a, a papers. He didn't have a resident permit. He worked as a street vendor for four years. All this time, she considered his uh, trajectory as a stable because he didn't have a legal residence permit. In 2013, he applied for asylum. He got his green card. 
He found a better job, as he argues, in a restaurant. He worked for long hours with minimum wage with, uh, with social security. In 2017, he was able to acquire refugee status and he emphatically stated that now I can go to Germany. In 2022, when we talked the last time, he said, okay, I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm not in Germany yet, but my dreams to go to Germany are still vivid. Now, Kalam was born in a middle-class family in Silet. After he graduated from college in Bangladesh, he pursued his desire, his aspiration to become a successful businessman in Europe. He moved from Bangladesh to Greece via Turkey. He arrived in Western Greece in Manolava in, amidst the economic crisis in Greece in 2012. He didn't have a regular status. He didn't have paper. He didn't know the language. His first job was in agriculture. Over the next years, Kalam invested in learning the Greek language, invested in establishing social ties with other Bangladeshis, with, other, with the local population of the village. And he was able to find, uh, he was able to find a flat in the village. He bought a second uh, hand car. He managed to regularize his status. He was able now to travel between the different villages in Bangladesh and uh, even to travel back in, um, he was able to, uh, to move between the different villages in uh, Western Greece, and he was able to travel to Bangladesh. After a few years, he was able to open his own business in Western Greece, and he's renovated his house back in Bangladesh. Now he has accomplished his aspiration. He has become a businessman in Europe. To conclude, uh, there are different patterns of social and spatial mobility which can depict in our narratives, in the Bangladeshi narratives, which have started in the pre-recession period and others are emerging during the economic crisis and after the crisis. So partial mobility is a strategy for seeking new employment opportunities for survival, for improving the social and economic status. In any case, it seems that the initial dimensions of precarity experienced by Bangladeshi do not necessarily lead to a permanent state of precariousness, not for all of them, but on the contrary, there are some resilient strategies, some attempts to improve their uh, social position and their future in the country of destination and the country of origin. And in this respect, the aspirations of migrants and these imaginaries of mobility play important role on how they move uh, forward and how they compare the situation with the future prospects. And uh, I'm sure we are going to talk a lot of, about this in, the, in tomorrow's policy uh, table, but uh, an important point to make here is that the existing and future policies need to take account migrants, individual and family aspirations for occupational mobility and social advancement. And here an example is the memorandum of understanding signed between the Greek and the Bangladeshi governments, which in order to, bleed, to bring Bangladeshi migrants to work in the agricultural sectors. However, if this kind of policy initiative, although it creates legal channel in order for people to move legally to one country, should take into account the aspiration of uh, Bangladeshi migrants in order to be successful. Thank you for your attention. Discussion tomorrow. We're going uh, quickly to the next presentation by Peter uh, He holds a PhD of, uh, from the School of Political Science of Aristotle University of Thessalonica. Uh, just completed one or two years ago, uh, and he was uh, focusing on migrant integration in rural areas in southern southern Europe. Um, this uh, research covers multiple problems of migrant integration in Europe and migrant well-being, with a special focus on Greece. And Italy, in the last years, we is working especially on survey data at Sean Stewart in Paris. We can't do the next And after yeah. this presentation, is going to be covered. Very short, short break because we're already.
No. So I will uh, use this few minutes to share with you the major findings of my PhD fieldwork uh, and uh, conclude uh, with uh, some suggestions for future research and uh, actions. Uh, however, let me start uh, with a brief introduction of the methodology I used and uh, uh, with the objectives of the research. The main research was to examine the impact of the place of living on migrant integration settlement and outcomes uh, in both objective and subjective terms. Uh, considering the well perceived well-being a crucial indicator, meaning that is it more important the, effect, the actual income or the satisfaction with uh, the income? Um, there was uh, a special focus on the spatial and uh, socioeconomic dimensions of uh, migrant incorporation. Uh, I wanted to provide uh, both uh, quantitative and qualitative evidence uh, and uh, trying uh, to examine and test uh, the comparative strengths and weaknesses uh, pointed out already in the literature about uh, living in uh, rural areas. So based on these uh, objectives, uh, um, three, um, a three level uh, of uh, comparison, of a special comparison emerged. Uh, I said, um, I compared um, within um, region, uh, I, I conducted within region comparisons between urban and rural areas between uh, different uh, typologies of rural areas, but also cross uh, regional uh, comparisons. Um, okay, I, I selected these two case studies, Dean uh, and uh, Crete, uh, based on several grounds and uh, many similarities between these two regions. Uh, but also a very important uh, difference that lies in the diff much more uh, decentralized uh, governance systems that, uh, and multi-level system that uh, Italy has adopted compared to Greece. Um, the, I examined uh, two national groups, uh, Albanians in Crete and uh, Moroccans uh, in uh, Sardinia. Um, but okay, I have to skip uh, the reasons. Uh, okay, uh, so data were obtained uh, through 54 semi-structure and um, um, a survey across the national regional survey in Sardinia and Crete. Uh, the target population was the foreign-born uh, Albanians in Crete. Uh, and the Americans in Sardinia. Uh, the, um, the survey questionnaire teams were uh, mostly inspired uh, uh, from um, the Zaragoza indicators on uh, migrant integration and uh, the indicators used uh, in uh, the two policy reports uh, used uh, uh, made uh, by the OECD and the you commission uh, uh, the so-called settling in indicators on migrant integration. Uh, so uh, I considered uh, very important uh, the classification of urban and rural typologies to come up uh, with uh, useful uh, findings uh, on the special dimension of migrant integration. So I used uh, the degree of urbanization as a uh, a comparative framework uh, for uh, classifying cities, towns and suburbs uh, and uh, rural areas, but I needed further to classify rural areas considering that the focus was on uh, these areas. Uh, so for this, I used uh, national and uh, regional special development plans. So, um, they emerged uh, five uh, special typologies, uh, cities, towns and suburbs, intermediate rural areas, remote rural areas, and coastal rural areas. Uh, these are the fieldwork locations in Crete, and uh, these were in uh, Sardinia. 
I recruited uh, mainly the respondents of uh, the survey through snowball sampling and uh, using several referral chains. So coming to the major findings uh, of uh, migrant incorporation, uh, here um, what I need uh, to stress is that uh, uh, first of all, it's difficult uh, to speak for migrant integration in rural areas. Uh, uh, integration in rural areas is not homogeneous between uh, the various areas. There are uh, important variations between coastal areas and uh, remote rural areas, especially in these regions. Uh, the other important finding, uh, trying to summarize uh, many different uh, findings together, is that uh, uh, it was uh, indeed uh, very important uh, to uh, examine integration also in subjective terms, because para, uh, paradoxically, uh, while uh, literature has stressed that uh, income uh, is uh, higher and in some areas uh, significantly higher compared to urban areas, uh, when I asked the participants about the satisfaction with their income in several rural areas, they were much more satisfied compared to the urban areas. Um, so meaning that always we need to uh, focus also on the subjective valuation of uh, well-being. Um, okay, as we have few time, uh, I will um, say that uh, another uh, important finding was that uh, in any case, uh, indeed, as the literature has stressed before, uh, moving further to the cities, uh, we see that uh, the satisfaction with the place of residence was reducing in both areas. And uh, this uh, finding was also corroborated by another one that uh, also the intention to stay was reduced uh, in, um, in uh, the specific area that the responder was, uh, um, was living, was reducing as well, moving from cities to rural areas with uh, the exception some coastal rural settlements. Okay, with this slide, um, I, uh, I want to say that uh, while I acknowledge that there is not uh, a perfect uh, migrant profile for rural areas, and uh, for sure I don't want to create uh, a stereotype about that, uh, is that uh, uh, in both regions, uh, some clear patterns emerged about uh, uh, specific uh, profiles and uh, with uh, experiences, aspirations, and needs uh, that could uh, fit better in rural areas compared to others. For example, rural background, uh, primary and secondary education, uh, people married with kids, and uh, especially their kids in early childhood. Uh, people obviously that in these areas they had uh, already social networks and, um, and that uh, they were the main reason for setting there anyway. And uh, if uh, the reason for migration in uh, those areas is labor with uh, driving uh, capacity and a high adaptation and assimilation um, uh, capacity, they are very important elements. And the same thing is that uh, while I don't want to argue that there is a, um, a rural wonderland for migrants, uh, indeed there are some specific um, uh, features, structural features of the place of residence that uh, makes uh, uh, more favorable the settlement uh, in these areas. For example, uh, if, of course, uh, the rural uh, settlement is closer to the main urban poles of the region, or uh, if uh, the access to services in this were uh, good, uh, we have the positive or stable demographic trends, uh, uh, economy, multifunctional economies that they combine both agricultural and non-agricultural activities, or where there is affordable housing, because 
as also a paradox, is uh, affordable and decent housing is not uh, uh, a granted, uh, let's say, uh, thing in uh, rural areas as well, from uh, what uh, I found out that I didn't expect. Uh, so, uh, yes, we have uh, the structural features of the place of living as very important uh, factors that are uh, safe in different ways, migrant integration. Okay, uh, I spoke about this. And uh, to come back, just that, as I say, in, uh, uh, in personal characteristics and aspirations are crucial for, uh, uh, for the settlement in such areas. I will not go through the policies, it's just because uh, I, what I think that uh, what is missing, let's say, uh, we miss uh, more quantitative evidence that uh, permit us uh, to uh, be more specific, uh, as we have so many independent variables and uh, infinite uh, uh, combinations uh, of uh, elements in uh, the settlements in the settlement on, in the settlement, uh, I think uh, we need to be specific uh, our findings to what gender, what age group, uh, what uh, religious affiliation group, what country of origin uh, they refer to. We need uh, more uh, repeated cross-sectional longitudinal studies to as uh, migrant integration. Is a long-term process. Uh, we need to understand how it evolves, and we can say just uh, for people that they settle there for two years, how oh, they are not integrated, for example, because it's not possible. It would be impossible for everybody uh, in two years to be integrated in a place. From my point of view, uh, we need more research for um, some specific groups, as uh, women and youth, that they are undercovered in uh, current research. We need to understand uh, how new information and digital technologies uh, influence the quality of life in such areas. I believe that this uh, uh, will be a very important element uh, already it is, but uh, especially in the future. And finally, as I said, as we have, uh, as migrant integration, I think is a very complex issue. It's really difficult to, uh, I believe to assess it with using uh, case studies. We need uh, a lot of data to understand what happens and why, where. Uh, so I believe that is inevitable, and I hope that uh, somehow the research community could, could join forces uh, to use uh, uh, artificial intelligence tools and uh, machine learning, uh, putting all this data together that uh, we be have uh, produced uh, to this day in order to help uh, orient, uh, uh, to help uh, to, to improve migrants orientation when they are not moving through social, their social networks. And uh, just to finish with a very provocative uh, proposal, like I, I, I believe that what is missing really is that as the travelers have their trip advisor, I think we need a migrant advisor that uh, collects all the research outputs we have produced together for specific, that match specific locations and also use uh, uh, more different data that uh, they are available already in order to improve the orientation of migrants in the future. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. 
You're starting again. the University of Urbina, and I'm very happy to chair the second session of our conference, uh, Migrating in Small and Medium-Sized Towns Policy Challenges. Unfortunately, I will be nothing else but a watchdog about the time uh, that lapse that each one has at this position. Um, Andrea Petrakin is uh, the first uh, speaker. Is a postdoctoral researcher at Collegio Carlo Alberto in Italy, where he's working with uh, Professor Tiziana Caponia on the scientific coordination of the uh, Horizon 2020 Holcomb project. Before, he worked as postdoctoral researcher at the Migration Policy Center of the European University Institute and holds a PhD in uh, politics according to 2020 by the University of Sheffield, supervised by Professor Andrew Gibbs. The floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to, to be here today and to present this paper, which is titled Understanding the Failure of Policy Diffusion in Integration Policy, Small European Localities. And this paper is um, presents some of the findings of the Holocom project, as already been mentioned. Um, so I will first of all um, provide a very uh, quick introduction of the project, and then I will move to the uh, specifics of this paper. Um, I will not enter very much into the more uh, theoretical and methodological aspects of the paper, but I'm happy to share it and to get feedback from, from you if you're interested in it. Um, so just very, very few words about the Holcom project. Um, this is again a Horizon 2020 project uh, coordinated by Tiziana Caponi, who is here uh, with us today. And it's looking at uh, integration, migrant integration in 39 small localities, um, which include a mix of small and medium sized towns and rural areas across eight EU countries. You can find them here in the map. There is no Greece, unfortunately. Um, and also a small component in Canada and, and Turkey. Um, and the project is broadly uh, structured into two parts. In the first part, we have um, studied local integration policies and multi level governance in these small localities, um, policies targeting in particular humanitarian migrants that arrived in Europe after 2014, excluding Ukrainians, because we did field work basically at the beginning of last year. Uh, while in the second part of the project, we are currently looking at integration outcomes broadly uh, conceived in these, in these same localities. Um, if you're interested in the other part of the project, the website that is, uh, you can see it there. Um, where you find a number of country reports, comparative reports, policy briefs written by all our partners in, in these countries. So if you're interested, you can have a look at the, at the web page. As you've already guessed, this paper stems from the first part of the project on policies and multi-level governance. And they come to the paper that I'm presenting you today. Um, what's the rationale for this paper? The paper moves from one observation that has been made by a number of reports uh, that have been produced also as outcomes of our project in the past few years, and that we also <clears throat> confirmed in, our, in the findings of our project. And the observation is that integration policy responses in these small localities tend to be very fractured, isolated, uncoordinated. So the EU urban agenda, for instance, points out that um, there are few knowledge transfers that take place among these small municipalities on evidence-based integration policy making. Um, and also there are other interesting reports from the spring projects and from other projects, um, Broadhead and Hillman, for instance, that also find that there are very few learning processes, very few knowledge transfers and transfers of best practices among these small localities. Um, is this surprising? Well, 
to some extent, it is also surprising for at least three reasons. First, there is a lot of knowledge and information available on best practices of immigrant integration produced by a number of studies and projects that have been run in the past uh, decades. Second, we know that there are a lot of actors involved in integration policy making, and some of them have interest in promoting the spread of these uh, practices. And third, we know that um, the existing literature suggests, the studies that have been made suggest that local policymakers tend to be pragmatic, tend to be um, um, adopt approaches oriented at problem solving, which would make them inclined to um, um, replicate policies that were practices that were um, 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 found to be effective in other places. So how is this lack of policy learning and policy diffusion explained by existing studies? Well, most studies point to structural and material factors that prevent uh, policy diffusion, such as lack of resources and funding, capacity, experience, infrastructure. It was mentioned also today in one of the other presentations, and this is also something that we find as part of the um, Holcomb project. But the question that um, I asked in this, in this um, paper is, but are there also other explanations? Or is it just a matter of funding or resources? Can we solve the problem of uh, the spread of, of good practices by providing more funds, or is there also something else? And to, um, to answer this question, I, um, and I have looked at a number of studies that have been done in other policy fields uh, on these mechanisms of policy diffusion and of policy learning. That tell us a number of interesting insights. And based on these works, um, um, I have identified three preconditions for policy diffusion or policy transfer, but based on which I derive three potential alternative explanations for, for this puzzle. Why, again, policy best practices do not transfer. And the first explanation sees, um, potential explanation sees this lack of policy diffusion as due to the lack of exchanges between local governments. The fact that local governments do not have venues, opportunities to exchange on integration policy, or to the fact that there are no actors that act as bridges, that are as, as mediators of information between different local governments. According to a second alternative potential explanation, the lack of policy diffusion might be due to conflicts between actors, between local governments or between local governments and these other actors. And we do know from other studies that divergences of views and conflicts between actors tend to undermine trust and to undermine the transfer of knowledge. According to a third potential explanation, um, policy diffusion uh, might be uh, instead hampered by political factors, political dynamics. This was also mentioned today. Um, and in another presentation. So other studies tell us that the availability of even trusted knowledge sometimes is not enough for the diffusion of policies. Um, policy diffusion also depends on how policymakers assess the political effects of policies, of, of knowledge, uh, and of their political needs, let's say. So in this paper, I try to test these three potential alternative um, explanations. I do not enter into the methodology, but just for you to know, these uh, results are based on interviews that, as part of the Holcomb uh, project, uh, we have conducted in um, 34 actually localities. So it's a kind of subsample of our uh, localities with 30, 355 actors involved in integration policy making in, in different respects. And we asked in a number of um, closed and open questions about how frequently they interact or exchange with other actors, whether uh, about conflicts and about uh, the importance of different factors for, for their decision-making processes to, to test the three alternative explanations. Again, if you're interested on, on the details, we can um, have a chat later. So uh, in the few minutes I have left, I will just illustrate briefly five main findings um, that we have um, produced. So according to the first uh, um, finding, so we do find our data suggests that there are very few direct exchanges on immigrant integration between different localities, between different go local governments. And these exchanges mostly take place within neighboring municipalities. Um, so these local governments have few venues to discuss uh, issues related to integration um, at higher levels of government. They, have, they are very rarely if ever involved in any kind of city network uh, um, on immigrant integration and so on. And also um, they are very much um, isolated from multi-level governance structures and policy discussions that take place at higher levels of governance um, at the national and the EU level. 
So as one of, the, of our interviewees tell us, uh, well, I can't actually read the, the code, but you, uh, you will, again, it points to the lack of knowledge transfer and the lack of communication between different levels of governance. Second finding, um, policy diffusion in these small localities seem to be therefore uh, highly dependent on the activation of free potential knowledge brokers and mediators, intermediaries of information that are regional governments, non-governmental organizations and employers organizations. Um, however, as this quote also suggests, uh, sometimes the private sector and civil society are not very much very coordinated internally within some localities and this very much hampers their knowledge broken in potential, their, their potential to contribute to the diffusion of best practices. So if the first expectation, the first explanation is largely confirmed, and uh, the second uh, potential um, um, alternative explanation is largely rejected. Um, in, uh, as a result of our, of our analysis, we do find that local integration policy making is characterized by a rather low level of conflict and local governments in particular are involved in largely collaborative interactions with other actors. And this is to some extent uh, surprising as it is partially at odds with the findings of other research works that have been done, particularly on asylum seekers reception, which seems to be a much more conflictual field. So yeah, the second explanation is largely um, rejected, while instead the third, explanation is largely confirmed. We do find that um, a great obstacle for policy diffusion seems to be really represented by the growing politicization of immigrant integration and of immigrant integration policy making in many of these small uh, localities. Um, so when we asked uh, um, our policy, the policy makers we interviewed about the importance <laughs> of different factors for the decisions that they have to, to, to take to implement a policy, to develop a policy in, in a migrant integration or not, what came out is that the two most important factors uh, that they mentioned are their values and ideas and particularly local attitudes towards uh, migrants. And as a third most important factor, um, exchanges with their members of their own political party. So again, three uh, kind of political factors that emerge as crucial. While on the contrary, exchanges with the civil society, exchanges with the private sector and other actors are overall uh, considered as rather unimportant by the majority of the 67 policymakers that we interviewed across these different uh, localities. Um, and so to some extent, these findings challenge some also established ideas in, in the literature about local integration policy making. So this idea that um, it, uh, I'm, I'm concluding that um, um, policymakers are inclined to, 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 to take pragmatic approaches in this field. And maybe it suggests that as it happened at the national level, more and more business interests and lobbying by pro-migrant groups have become much less potent compared to the concerns of the citizens. As it's a quote from um, a paper by Ajab to uh, Bail and Gaddis. And I conclude with a fifth um, finding. Uh, we do find that these preconditions for policy diffusion about which I've just uh, tell you seem to vary a lot across different localities. We try to get the representative, semi-representative sample of European localities across a variety of different characteristics. And it seems that these conditions are more favorable in localities with progressive center-left local governments, in bigger localities of so a medium-sized towns in our sample, and in localities, and once again, it very much connects with what uh, uh, was said before, in localities with a lower presence of radical right parties uh, within local councils. Uh, so we suggest that if ever policy diffusion uh, is going to take place, this is largely likely to take place in these kind of restricted circles of committed localities instead of involving the majority of small localities. And of course, these findings have a number of policy implications. You can also find a neat, very interesting policy brief written by Petrus Colton and Maria Schiller uh, in, our, in our website, which touches upon some of these issues. And I stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, also for sticking to the time. Uh, uh, on a side note, I would like to thank a lot the Human Rights 360 for the beautiful uh, coffee break they offered just now. And uh, so the next uh, uh, contributor is uh, Babette 
apologies for the pronunciation, Babette uh, Weichardt, Hans Leinfeld, and Pascal de Decker uh, 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 contribution uh, of a paper, uh, why integration policies uh, should include a greater spatial element, focus on newcomers' spatial capital in small and medium-sized towns. And uh, you have it here? So is it still on? Hello? No. No. Hello? Start without and then I, I, will, I will try without. Okay. Um, so today I will talk to you about um, spatial capital uh, of newcomers in Flanders and why it should be more um, included in designing uh, integration policies um, and implementing them. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so uh, the research starts from a growing body uh, of literature on uh, the changing uh, geography of arrival towards uh, medium-sized and small uh, cities and towns, like all of the research today, I think, um, which uh, could be by counter urbanization, but also by bypassing uh, metropolitan arrival neighborhoods, which is the case for our respondents today. Um, the goal of the research is to uh, shed a different light on the arrival and settlement processes of uh, recent newcomers um, towards these uh, small town and uh, small and medium-sized towns um, by answering two research questions. So the research is, has two parts. The first one is what steers the housing trajectories uh, of newcomers towards the Flemish nebular city. It's actually it's everything without the, the metropolitan um, gateways um, and also um, how are these uh, newcomers and it's not how are these new newcomers uh, making use of the Flemish nebula city um, and by focusing on uh, what is the role of the relationship between the individual's social position but also the geographical uh, location um, and their mastery of wider uh, living environment. Um, so to start with, we focus on uh, the participation in society as an interaction between a uh, social and spatial position. Um, and yeah, social position is defined by uh, per personal characteristics like gender, age, uh, and family, family situation, but also by individual capital uh, like Bourdieu so social and economical and cultural capital. Um, but uh, next to uh, a position in social space, uh, we also occupy a uh, position in uh, physical space. And this, um, we assume, is uh, also defined by a four type of capital, uh, spatial capital, a concept that is uh, first used by Levy in uh, 1994. Um, so what is spatial capital? Um, it's composed of uh, two elements, uh, position capital and situation capital. Uh, is it working? Yeah. So it's composed of both uh, position capital and situation capital, which is linked to uh, proximity and accessibility uh, in um, yeah, um, planning analysis. Uh, position capital is about uh, the environment uh, where a person lives, the place, and the resources such as uh, shops, um, people, facilities, uh, and parks, and organizations that are available on the location of the home. Situation capital, on the other hand, concerns uh, the ability to, uh, 
to use these re researches, but also to access them. So accessibility and mobility is also part of this uh, situation. Um, and this makes that when individuals can be mobile, they also uh, can compensate or mitigate shortcomings in their proposition capital. So if they live in an, uh, in an environment where they are, uh, that is poor in, uh, in facilities, for example. Um, but why is um, space or the use of space uh, capital? Uh, it's because it's linked to an indiv individual and uh, it also differs from individual to individual um, and from situation to situation. So it's not only about a question about access, but also about uh, access or accessibility physically, but also about uh, access in uh, relation to, uh, for example, affordability or utility. Um, and about skills and competences. Um, and that is why also um, we call it realized accessibility. So the appropriation of resources is not the same that, than having it in your surroundings. Uh, and the second one, and it's not readable, but it's also because it's convertible into other uh, types of capital. So social, cultural, and economical capital can be converted in uh, spatial. Um, now, uh, newcomer spatial capital in the Flemish spatial context. Now, one of the key uh, components of uh, Flemish uh, in integration policies is uh, the realization of all facilities and services uh, for target groups. Um, and in Flanders, local authorities are largely self-responsible for implementing these integration policies. But uh, two observations in relation to uh, the physical environment or the ge ge geographical layout uh, risk being overlooked when uh, implementing uh, these policies um, on a local level. Uh, one is that the position capital or facilities and services are unevenly distributed um, in, in Flemish uh, spatial context. And another one is that there's a uh, migrants uh, experience a mismatch between um, the context where re resources were formed and the new spatial or institutional uh, context where they validate or need to validate uh, these researches as uh, capitals. For example, um, they are no longer allowed to drive a car because uh, their license is not recognized in a new context. Um, so that's why we thought it was uh, important to, um, to gain insight in which uh, facilities and services uh, newcomers use, but also how they access them. And this we, we try to uh, research by uh, making time space areas of, of uh, newcomers in their new living environments, um, which are si situated in uh, uh, four um, small or medium sized towns, um, going from 10,000 to 30,000 inhabitants. Um, and so frequently we interviewed them um, asking about uh, activity location, modes of transport, uh, choices and constraints. Um, now I will show some findings, but I will not do, uh, show them all. Um, spatial capital um, is formed on, uh, on or, or situated on different levels, uh, going from the dwelling to the neighborhood, but also uh, to the scale of the municipality or the region. Uh, and the findings will, will start from the dwelling towards the, the region uh, scale. Um, when we look at the dwellings of, um, of our uh, respondents, the quality uh, uh, of housing um, is inadequate for uh, uh, family living because uh, hosting guests, um, playing study spaces for children is um, not there because they live in, uh, in really small houses. And uh, the functioning of, of the housing market is uh, uh, defining for this location, but also for the type of housing. Um, because of the lack of living space, uh, important uh, elements in the position capital of our respondents are uh, parks and school environments, because uh, they serve as uh, places of encounter. Um, people are meeting there during weekends, um, they uh, 
if they uh, because they are, the living room spaces are too small. Um, I will skip this. How long do I still have? Five minutes. Seven, seven minutes. Ah, seven. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, what we also see in the in the time space dive in terms of our respondents is that uh, they they go to metropolis cities in 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 search for uh, affordability and cultural uh, and linked to cultural uh, preferences um, because. Uh, they don't have uh, these kind of services or facilities in their uh, new living environments. Now, findings on uh, situation capital. Um, a really important one is the accessibility of, uh, of uh, work, because a lot of um, people, they, they don't have a, a recognized uh, license. And they are working in uh, in sectors that are uh, situated in uh, industrial areas, which are not uh, not accessible by uh, by public transport. So there's a link between uh, having their cultural capital uh, approved and uh, not being able to get a, a job uh, in the location that uh, is uh, remote. Uh, some other findings on situation. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, it's okay. Um, uh, for some of the respondents, or uh, almost all of them, the help of uh, NGOs or a civil society uh, organization was really crucial uh, in directly accessing spatial capital both on terms of the position capital for uh, in terms of looking for housing or providing a place uh, of encounter, but also in increasing cultural capital uh, that is converting, uh, convertible uh, by doing uh, cycling ses sessions or Dutch lessons um, or giving theoretical driving uh, lessons. One of the uh, key um, conclusions is that when we want to achieve in uh, giving access to all facilities uh, to newcomers, um, integration policies must go hand in hand with uh, spatial and housing um, policies. Um, and there's a question if it's possible to do it only on the local scale. I think um, when it goes for housing, um, I think the re regional scale is much better to, uh, to act. Um, and also um, linked to, uh, to the spatial um, uh, policies, um, we need to look for uh, public uh, meeting spaces, but also green spaces in the, in the neighborhoods where uh, newcomers live, because it's an important uh, aspect of the uh, capital. Um, we also need to facilitate uh, NGOs or social uh, organizations that are um, having an integrate uh, a role um, and also um, hel helping um, the refugees in their um, um, implementation and spatial I think that's all. Thank you very much, Kobe. Um, the next comes from uh, Belgium. Um, is, uh, Affiliated to the research group planning for people with vanity and landscape at the Faculty of Architecture in Ghent. And instead, Connery, we have Fiona Costello and Louise Humphreys from the UK, University of Cambridge. Fiona and Louise from uh, Giros. Okay. <laughs> place I feel welcome, the role of multi based support and advice in the context of welcome, community cohesion, and integration support. Perfect, yeah, it's not what you speak to. Okay.
So thank you for inviting us here today. I'm from a tidy NGO and Fiona um, works on research at the University of Cambridge and I think our story is about why we've had to become change agents and why we've gone down this route of looking and embracing research. So the title of our presentation is The Only Place I Feel Welcome because that's what so many of the people that we work with say to us. And Gyros, as an organisation, was founded in 1998, um, mainly in response to refugees coming from the Balkans conflict, if you can remember that. <laughs> and it was a time when um, immigration wasn't politicised, probably, and certainly not as deeply racist as it is in our country at the moment. So we're what we call a charity, which is an NGO. We're based on the east of England, which is that bit that sticks out on the side. <laughs> and... Most of our staff have got a lived experience of different immigration um, routes into the UK, um, asylum, refugee, EU migrants. We recruit from within our communities, um, apart from myself here, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> um, but my colleague Armin Nikodosian is here too. Um, and we think it gives us a fundamental kind of expertise into what people that we're supporting go through. And we work at three levels behind the block there. <laughs> we work at the individual level, so people coming through our doors needing that extra support. Our services are multilingual and culturally kind of sympathetic and understanding. We also work at the community level, so we work in groups, we talk about cohesion rather than integration, and then the new area that we work with is trying to change society through policy and system change. The people we work with, um, as we heard earlier, we have layers of migrants within the UK from EU migrant workers. We tend to only work with very vulnerable EU migrant workers around exploitation, trafficking. We're just kind of dropped out of the system. We also work with family members of EU, um, of EU um, residents, refugees and asylum seekers. Within the refugees and asylum systems, our government has put layers um, of different schemes and the reason this is important is all around eligibility. Your immigration status in the UK now underpins everything that you do. So we have lots of different levels and for us as a small NGO we realised we had to really understand the immigration policy so we've set up and invested heavily in the kind of legal immigration system so we're a community group that have got this immigration expertise for that reason. Mainly the government provides accommodation, roof over people's heads, food, three meals a day, eight pounds a week, and basic toiletries. <laughs> and everything else is filled by organisations, by us. It may be about language learning. It may be just about clothing because of the right of what they're wearing. It's about friendship. It's about sharing. It's about orientation. <laughs> And it's also about immigration advice. We realised that we would never meet the demand. And it was for us becoming increasingly impossible to respond to the changes in immigration policy because it literally changes every week. We have as many <laughs> prime ministers as we have immigration law. <laughs> <laughs> so we've developed research partnerships, currently working with um, Cambridge University, but also with the big government departments. Through COVID, we've worked with the UK Health Security Agency, we're now working with the Parliamentary Ombudsman in Health Services <laughs> <laughs> because what we need to do is show what is happening on the ground floor, the impact it has on people's lives, on the people that have migrated here, but also on the wider community. As a small NGO, it's anecdotal. If we can get that information fed into government departments and to research institutions, it suddenly becomes fact, which then informs policy and system design. And just one last bit, very quickly about the hostile environment. We had a Home Secretary who actually became one of our recent Prime Ministers. Um, he described this, we're going to make the UK a hostile environment, the most hostile environment that we can to people trying to seek asylum and, and migrate to the UK. And this works both ways. So we now have a situation where people who've migrated to the UK also don't trust the government. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And quite often, we're that conduit 
between what the government was saying, what local government is saying, and what people need to hear and understand in order to thrive in the UK. Thank you. Hi everybody. Has it stopped working? Okay, can you can you hear me if I shout? I'm going to be very quick. So um, I'm from the University of Cambridge, based on the of Law, and we've had this research partnership with Gyros. We've got quite a unique partnership, I think, in the process, in the way that I also work at Gyros and I work at the University of Cambridge. And what this has meant for our research is that um, we can kind of see research issues as they come up, emerging trends we're able to identify very quickly, and that helps us then to feed that into policy and into the research that we're undertaking. We've undertaken a longitudinal analysis of the Gyros database, looking at their work from 2015 to 2020, identifying what legal issues migrants are facing, what help they're coming to Gyros for. So you can see on the poster here from Anglia Ruskin, they very helpfully provided a map of England, which shows the um, availability of legal advice in the UK. And the red areas are where there is no legal advice available, which is most of England. <laughs> so we are then looking at, okay, so people are experiencing legal issues. They can't get legal advice. Where do they go? They go to Gyros and what are the problems that they are experiencing? What we found is what is seen in other research is that more, normally people are experiencing more than one issue at a time. They have clustered problems and the problems tend to A, cluster and B, cascade. One problem leads to another. These are the four most commonly clustered issues in the Gyros database, employment, housing, welfare benefits and debt. And you can see how one of these problems would lead to another. If you lose your job, you have problems with your housing, you need to access welfare benefits and you go into debt, you have debt issues. It's all and what's unique about the service that Gyros provides, uh, and Louise mentioned, is everything is underpinned by your immigration status. Your right to rent, your right to work, your right to access welfare benefits. So Gyros are kind of more than a general advice service because they have to have that legal immigration expertise to actually be able to give any advice to their, to their clients. As well as the university partnership that JARAS formed, they are also forming their own kind of um, research arm of JARAS, as we call it, called Migration Matters East. And this is where we're building on the, the kind of rich tapestry of data that JARAS hold on, on a group that are considered hard to reach, which I'll talk about in a second, and trying to build that stronger picture of, of what experiences people are having in the region, working with other migrant advice charities across the region as well. We can talk about that over coffee or dinner if people are interested in hearing more. Here's a map of the East of England for anyone who may not know where Great Yarmouth is, which is fair enough. <laughs> so I just picked out two points from the research I thought might be interesting in the context of um, integration and in the context of welcome. So firstly, as I said, we're, we're working with a group that are often described as hard to reach. And actually, you only need to attend a Jaros drop-in session to know that this group is not hard to reach. Their services are over-prescribed and they find it difficult to deal with the, the need that there is. So it's feeding this information into kind of policymakers and local government. But actually, we have these really key NGOs based in communities, working with communities who are trusted in communities, and actually working with them might be a better way to find out what's happening um, with, with people in those communities. And they're often led by those experts with experience as well. Um, and, and also the jobs provide these holistic services, that kind of rich tapestry of data that I'm talking about. Normally in, in the legal world, you have a legal specialization. You go see a family lawyer, you go see a criminal lawyer. Whereas a jar you go see one person, they'll basically do everything of that problem cluster that you're experiencing, as well as helping you to learn English, helping register your child at school, providing you with food, providing you with volunteer opportunities. Jaros will, will do all of that um, at one visit. Secondly, then one of another interesting point that came out in our research, particularly around Brexit, but it wasn't a, a, a consequence of Brexit, people were experiencing this before, was that everyone had experienced some kind of go home rhetoric in the community. They'd been verbally abused on the street, some had been physically assaulted on the street um, and had been told to go home. And it, it was intensified by Brexit, but predated it. And what a lot of people said was they were, they were undertaking this self-censorship in communities. They were too afraid to use their own language in the street because they would then um, maybe be a victim of an assault or a verbal abuse. And what that meant was people then felt much more able to be themselves. When they came in to see Jairos, they were talking to someone who was speaking their own first language. And actually that sense of belonging and welcome was much more intensified because they didn't feel um, welcome anywhere else they were going. And they had a kind of constant anxiety of self-censoring in communities as well as the stress of always trying to translate or not being able to communicate um, at all. And then I'll, I'll just end on some quotes we've had from clients quite recently. I say we, the royal we, I don't do any case work, but I mean has had <laughs> recently um, saying, you know, first, I'd really like to thank you. Um, it's been a very emotional 
emotional time. I'm sorry, I that. that's quite a very emotional time. And to be talked to and treated like a human means a lot to both of us. And I think that really sums up um, the service that Giles are offering, but also bringing it back to these people that we're talking about today when we're looking at integration. And we cannot thank you enough for your kindness, diligence, and willpower to make this happen. Wherever we asked, the answer was always no, not possible. We're so grateful that you didn't take no for an answer and you stuck it out with us. This is the best and most important thing that has happened in all my life. So that's the, the service that Jai is offering and the role that they can play in, a, in the context of integration and uh, local government. Thank you very much. I don't know how we do <laughs> Thank you very much. So, uh, Fiona, as you understood from as a research associate from the uh, University of Cambridge and uh, research lead for charity Gyros. And uh, she works on the EU Migrant Worker Project, examining the experiences of EU nationals living in the UK post Brexit, particularly in respect of legal status and employment rights. And uh, now we return home in a certain way, home as piste, home, uh, with a, a collaborative paper from uh, uh, Stein, Stein uh, Osterling and Thomas Schwendt, University of Antwerp, and Eduardo Barberis and Federico Rossi from the University of Urbino. Small cities, large conflicts, far right parties, and the politics of integration policy making in two small European cities. Stein is full professor in urban sociology at the University of Antwerp, the scientific director of the Hannah Arendt Institute of Diversity, Urbanity, and Citizenship. And uh, Ona is a PhD student in sociology at the University of Antwerp within the Center of Research on Environmental and Social Change. And she's working with us on various working packages. The floor is yours. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ona Schijewitz, and today uh, Stan Osterling and I will present uh, the findings of our paper about radical right parties and integration policy making in two small cities. Uh, the first city is Minova, which is located in Belgium, and the second one is Fermo, which is located in Italy. So first I will explain shortly the literature. So if we look at the literature on integration policies in small cities, um, we can see that the diversity of immigration flows towards small cities and the increasing important role of local authorities in designing and developing their own immigration policies has increased uh, the complexity of integration policy making for small cities. Um, this is also often called the local term in migration studies. Um, this represents an additional element of complexity for every local authority, but especially for small cities where are often confronted with limited capacity, expertise, and uneven power relations with upper level institutions. Um, this is also especially the case uh, when we came to a loss of cultural identity and feelings of um, being left behind. Um, Rodriguez Posé also describes this as the revenge of places that don't matter. However, in this literature, we can find a gap. Um, there are still few studies taking into account the role of electoral politics in shaping local integration policy making in small cities, uh, especially where there is a rise of anti-immigration and radical right parties. So what is a radical right? Um, the radical right in our paper, we describe it uh, following the definition of Mudda, who says that a radical right is um, a political party that accepts the essence of democracy, but opposes fundamental elements of liberal democracy, 
and mostly members rights to law and separation of powers. In general, we can see that they share an anti-immigration discourse. Uh, moreover, their role in polarizing the debate about integration and um, it's not working anymore. <laughs> their role in polarizing uh, the debate about uh, immigration and the adoption of restrictive policies cannot be denied. Um, however, in this literature, there are um, there are some gaps. So uh, there's still more research needed on the indirect influence of radical right parties uh, on the integration policy making. Um, so when they are not holding government positions, so when they are seated actually in the opposition. Also, these dynamics are mostly set on national level and not on the local level. So this was the literature. Now I will explain our methods and data. So we have two research questions. Does the rise of radical right parties affect local immigrant policy making within, within small cities? And if yes, how does this impact actual policy contexts? So we have two, two uh, data sources, first with our own document analysis of supra and local policy documents. So for example, integration decrees, uh, multi-annual plans of Fermo and Minova. And secondly, we draw on 34 city scriptures interviews with local Local politicians. Um, and both cases, case design. So here you can see some numbers about uh, Nino and Fedemo. So you see they have a similar population size. Um, they also, in the, in the amount of people with an immigration background is around 20% in Nino and in Fermo is around 10. Um, they are also are confronted with the declining local economy, contrasting with a very um, flourishing industrial past. So the unemployment rate in Inovi is 4% and Fermo is 8.6. And both cities also have rising votes for the radical right. Um, so in Inovi it's 18% and in Fermo 33, which is really a huge increase of votes for radical right parties. Um, so you can see that these cases are very similar. However, uh, now Stan Osterling uh, will explain the research findings of. Thank you, Ola. And maybe before I start, I should acknowledge Federico Rossi, who carried out most of the interviews here in Fermo in Italy, but he is not, could not be uh, with us. It's also special because we're going to talk about Nino, and we have two uh, people working for the City Council of Nino present in this room. So I'm curious to, to hear what uh, uh, they will make of our findings. So they can talk, the field can talk back, right, <laughs> in real time. Um, so basically what we are trying to uh, understand is how electoral politics, specifically the rise of radical light, the radical right, in, uh, on the local level, what they do and how they influence the way uh, migrant integration policies are formulated on, on the local level in Europe and, and Fermo. And there are three mechanisms that are important here, at least as far as we can see in, uh, uh, in, in, our, um, in our findings. The first one is quite obvious, but it, it, it's important. I think uh, one of the, uh, Anna also already mentioned it when she was talking about Bulgaria, and that is that radical right parties in their rise, they are able to really put that uh, issue on the agenda. And in both cases, both FEMO and both in Nino, you know, they basically say the rise of radical right party is also, they also, they uh, implicate in their rise also the agenda setting of that topic very high on the political agenda. Um, so they're very, they, 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 they're indirectly influenced policy making by changing the agenda of local uh, policymakers. They put that right in front, right central in the agenda, even if they're not in power. So both in federal, neither in, you know, they're not in power, but even if they're opposition parties, they manage in sort of dominating agenda by setting the agenda and putting migrant integration quite central into uh, policy making. And they do that through mediatic attention. So they really play on the local media to be able to kind of uh, continuously um, 
raise stories, raise the profile of these kind of issues in, in local media. So, for example, in, in, in Fermo, uh, what was very important is leader three, actually, I'm not sure whether I explained that right. It's, uh, it's one of the peripheral neighborhoods in uh, Fermo where most of the migrants, uh, labor migrants, are concentrated. That particular neighborhood and what happened in the neighborhood was, very, was a very strong source of, of continuous news about uh, what was happening in that town. And it was very instrumental in putting migrant integration very high on the agenda. So there were racist incidents. I think in 2016, we were quite instrumental in, and, and many of the local people say, this is the moment at which really the agenda setting happened around the uh, racist attacks in, 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 in that peripheral uh, neighborhood where most migrants were concentrated. The same in true is in Ninove, where the, um, I think in the run-up to the election of 2019, specifically, uh, many local stakeholders tell us that this was the moment when the agenda was really set and put uh, migration uh, integration was put very central on the uh, on the local uh, elections and that has of course to do with language politics uh, Ninova is in the Dutch speaking periphery of Brussels Brussels is a francophone city that originally was Dutch speaking so with migration comes the French language in Dutch speaking territory so that makes it very sensitive so language politics is one of these uh, issues that acts as a vehicle for fear and concern about uh, migrations, but many other issues as well, of course, security uh, around the railway station, quite, quite typical. You see many young migrants around the railway station that become then a vehicle to say, okay, all kinds of things are happening, bad things are happening here. So people start getting concerned about exactly that. That is put into the media and social media as well as, 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 as mass media. And that then raises that profile of that issue on the agenda. Uh, by which local policymakers find no other way uh, have have no other way of responding to that by continuously also responding to it. They cannot really uh, sort of stay away from these these topics. And so you have a quote here. Um, I think that's a quote from from Ninova, um, where uh, one of the interviews said that it, it feels like there is a hot breath in your neck all the time. So it's the extreme right, the radical right, is constantly breathing in your neck to kind of respond to that issue and uh, notice that. Uh, respond to this issue and talk about the issue and, and be, be shown to be kind of uh, concerned about that issue as well. Um, and it's very hard not to respond. So they basically say, Forza Nino is a radical right party here. If, if they get into the media with some, with some topic, you really need to kind of respond to that, but you can't be showing them to be the bad guy because they are the ones that raised the issue and that actually, uh, um, yeah. Secondly, and uh, importantly, a second mechanism that we kind of identify uh, in this, um, on, the, on the local level is that because this is a high profile issue, the government has to, the local government has to do something. So they have to kind of pursue some kind of an integration policy of some kind. It can be very assimilationist, can be more supportive, but they have to do something. The problem then is, and that's a bit of an, an ironic situation, if you do something, then you can be criticized for spending extra resources on migrants. And given that the radical right is pushing that they don't want you to spend extra money on, on, on migrants or another uh, additional topic which they can kind of create a political discontent about. So you have to pursue some kind of an integration policy for these people, but you can't say too loudly that you're pursuing and you're spending extra resources on, on that particular category of people. So it means you have to pursue an integration policy at the same time disguise it. And uh, both in, in both uh, in both cities or both towns, we found ways of uh, in, in ways through which they were trying to disguise this. Um, so uh, basically, what they what they mostly try to do is in, in is they they pursue a policy, but they are very careful in presenting it as a policy for all of the population. So, for example, they wouldn't have special uh, uh, a special place for people to get support, but there would be a citizen's office in which migrants can also help. And then there would be in that office a mediator that then supports migrants who come to that office rather than saying we have a special uh, office for uh, advice to get um, for that specific migrant. Skip the quote because I don't have uh, much time, but I've explained uh, that already. A third mechanism, the last mechanism to which this happens is that they rescale local migrant integration policy to different levels uh, and also uh, not just rescale it uh, to, to another level, but they also involve non-public uh, actors that then pursue that integration policy. That's very clear in Fermo, where there was a longer tradition of migration. They actually outsource a lot of the uh, services to migrants to a non-profit organization, who then says, we have to carry out that work because the city council doesn't want to be seen to do that extra work for. Uh, so it's, it's happening, but it's not happening. Is happening at an arm's length, so they get less criticized for that. What's happening in in in, in Inova then is that the, the national the local the national government 
finds it hard to openly go against radical rights. They give money to the local government and say, you can, you, can, you can do it, but you're, you know, we're just giving you the money. You can do whatever with it, whatever you want. But they actually pass the burden on to the, to the local level for making difficult decisions. But it's also often, um, as far as it gets in Fermo, and that's my last sentence here. In Fermo, for example, they uh, move it to another technical body, for example, the Prefecture, which is a sort of, if I understand it right, it's a, government, a central government body, or AST, which is a kind of supra, an intermunicipal body, which is more technical. So they then pursue integration policy, but it's, it's sort of moved away from the actual center of uh, local decision making in attempt not to be criticized for that by the radical right. So these three mechanisms, the rescaling and centralization of policy, uh, agenda setting, and kind of disguising that you're doing something specifically for that category is one way in which local, it's a three ways in which local governments are seen to, um, to respond to the radical right, which is sort of mobilizing the local governments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for the very challenging passing to the next one. Take a breath and we go. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're missing uh, the Walter. Uh, I was supposed to do the presentation for the municipality of Fermignano. Uh, will be substituted by Eduardo Barberis. And the first contributor is Will Jones. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really loud. Do I have to use the mic? Because otherwise, the people are there won't hear. In which case, I kind of like moving my hands. So, with your permission, I would prefer to just shout at you. <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> I sort of screen set things and so on. And what I do, I just, I tend to just turn away from the microphone and then no one can hear anything anyway. Uh, okay, where well, I put your presentation. Well, I've disappeared. I'm in the recycle bin. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my self-esteem. <laughs> you deleted me. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, <laughs> 15 minutes, yeah? Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Will. Thank you very, very much for having me. I have a bit of an interloper here. Um, I'm here because of a new project at the University of Copenhagen, funded by the Marie Curie. Beginning. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the kinds of things I'm thinking about, um, but we're not finished yet, right? So I don't have a finding section as such. Let's start here. Great. So don't worry, you don't have to read it. I've blurred out the text on purpose so you can't even try. There's been a participation revolution, as of course you all knew already. Uh, in 2014, the Interagency Standing Committee, the thing that coordinates humanitarian affairs for things like refugees, announced that the participation of refugees had never before been important, but now it was, and we were going to include them and let them participate properly in the running of the international refugee regime, right? And indeed, there has been a lot of this stuff. So much so that James Milner and his colleagues now say that refugee participation is an emerging norm of the international refugee regime. However, that's also what we said in 1997. <laughs> and that's also what we said in 1990. And that's also what we said in 1985. <laughs> refugee participation is one of these weird concepts that seems to be permanently on the brink of arriving. We're about <laughs> to do it. We're about to take it seriously. Um, and then when it turns out that we do have to, you know, transfer power to powerless people, we immediately go, no, 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 we didn't, we didn't mean that. Uh, so, I'm going to give you a tiny bit of theory, a really tiny bit of theory. Here's a boring definition from a boring politics textbook from the 1970s, with apologies to Joanne Parry, who's a very nice person, I'm sure. Political participation, kind of core concept in political science, or at least it should be, and yet, 
these definitions are kind of controversial from the beginning for two reasons. One, how much participation? What is enough participation? What is meaningful participation? And two, I swear I looked at that definition about 15 times as an undergraduate and never noticed that there are two bits of it uh, that are not the same at all. That taking part in something is not quite the same as having a share in it. So with that in mind, let's talk about the first of these two. This is Shelley Arnstein, assistant to the assistant to the American Secretary of Housing uh, in the 1960s who writes this classic article about the idea of a ladder of participation. And in her definition, citizen participation, she says citizens, but anyone's participation is citizen power. There is a, con a continuum, a ladder of participation from bullshit to real power. And real participation is citizen control, or in our case, we might think refugee control or migrant control more generally. And even back in 1969, <laughs> Shelley Arnstein knew that when you know, people suddenly proposed sharing power with uh, Blacks, Mexican-Americans, Puerto Ricans, etc., the American consensus on this principle explodes. So nothing has really changed since 1969. Now I want to take you back to that idea that there's two types of participation, taking part and having a share. I don't have too much time to go through this, but these are two very different thoughts. Right? The idea that you're there along for the activity, which may well be important, taking part in the school sports day might be very important to you, as opposed to having a share, having a part of ownership of something. And normally when we think about democracy, that's the important bit. That's the one we really mean. So again, this stuff, apologies. There are two logics of this. Credited to Herbert Scaff from 1975, which I can tell you more about later, but I'm pushed for time, so I'm going to move on. What do refugees get when we talk about refugee participation? There are some places where we mean they get to participate exactly as citizens do in democratic political processes. Here in South Sudan, here in the Central African Republic, you'll notice places that are very, very, very uh, uh, damaged by conflict, often places of deep humanitarian dependency with large numbers of internally displaced people, not developed liberal Western societies as such. For them, you get refugee engagement forums, refugee public meetings, town hall meetings, that sort of thing. There are some refugees in Kampala at the Refugee Engagement Forum. Here is Mustafa, the Canadian refugee delegate to the United Nations at their budget meeting. And down there is the American Refugee Congress. So these are forms of institutionalized participation for refugees as refugees, aiming to put their voice at the top of power. Some of the things similar to what we've been talking about earlier today. Big one, the UNHCR does, is participatory assessment. What does that mean? That means that when we design programs for refugees, we will ask them. Uh, and that is more or less as far as it goes, but we do do quite a lot of it. So here is one in Myanmar. Here is a project for the a construction of latrines in South Sudan. The other one uh, is from Colombia. And there is now a handbook. Everyone is supposed to do it. And this is a form of participation that refugees get basically at the beginning and at the end of policy interventions. You're allowed to feedback on how you would like it to be set up, or you're allowed to do it at the end. Then, that should be RLO, I beg your pardon, oh, it's probably a lowercase L, isn't it? RLO, refugee-led organizations. The Italians are very into this, you can see. Uh, where you find some refugee-led organizations and you give them money and you pay them to run programming on your behalf. This, on the one hand, is very empowering, but it often has the effect of making those organizations more uh, account, uh, more accountable, more, more indebted to their funder than to the refugee population they often set up to support. And so it was often very, very, uh, very damaging for these organizations in the long run. And the big one in Greece, because here we are. Some of you may have experienced this 250 page document. No? Oh well. So <laughs> you and it now think they're very good at communicating with communities in Greece. They think they're very good at incorporating refugees into their decision making and engaging in refugee participation in these contexts. Don't read the whole thing. 
few marks, we don't have time. How do they do participation over all of groups? We have 40 group discussions with 200 people, probably in a room much like this one, probably for a couple of hours. And even they say, we know it's not that many people. We know it's difficult to reach these people. We know that's not very good, even in the place where they think they're doing it pretty well. So what's the big picture here? Move. You will never know. Here we are, the big picture. Refugee participation happens once a year if you're lucky. Maybe, maybe once every three months if you're really, really lucky. It is nose-bleedingly expensive to run these kinds of big participatory assessment exercises. Much of them, like these engagement forums, are for the, refuge, the elite refugees that get paid to go along to these things. They're very, very narrow cast, right? So you might have one refugee representative of the United Nations. That probably doesn't mean that much to the greater mass of refugees in Canada who were neither asked nor told. And refugees often spot that participation is nonsense, that it is manipulative, that it's an exercise in co-option, that it's not really about doing much more than legitimating policy exercises that people were going to be implementing anyway. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Despite the fact that I do think organizations really do care about refugee participation, at least they put a lot of effort into it. So our research is about ways in which this could be done better, right? We're currently putting a lot of effort into something that refugees in general don't, don't think is terribly successful. I tried, uh, in deference to the crowd, to come up with examples from small towns. Not all has been possible. This is the Constituency Development Fund of Jamaica that has a digital platform that allows citizens to propose and discuss how they're going to spend government money for particular development projects in their area. So, I'm talking too much. In the mid-2000s, big e-democracy boom, lots of people get very excited in their stuff. We're talking about websites or apps, or in some cases, things that work using uh, WAP2 enabled phones. You can even do it like that way. Um, in general, you shouldn't think of this stuff as replacing the offline. Uh, in general, refugees say they really value face-to-face -face contact with real human beings, and we should believe them. Uh, and so you should think of this as a way to supplement offline routes of engagement and inclusion and participation. And here's a list of stolen from Matt Sandberg of the kinds of things that you can do on these programs. And that one I will allow you to read while I have some water. <laughs> Cannot read, so I won't read it out. Here is a local authority in the north of England trying to find out what their, their constituents would like them to do about the budget cuts, right? So instead of just asking people, what do you like? Because then people will say everything and they don't want any of the cuts. The idea of this tool was to enable people to start thinking about trade-offs, right? Which of these things really matters to you? Which is the more important one? This is a consensus-based tool developed in local authority areas in rural Taiwan, believe it or not. Um, so, why might you use a digital participation platform? Many poor people, but also refugees in particular, you might think, don't have enormous amounts of wealth and enormous amounts of time. So you might be interested in forms of participation that are cheap. Further to that, you might be interested in forms of uh, participation that are asynchronous. So you decide when you participate, as opposed to having to come to that one meeting. And if you can't make it to that meeting because you've got childcare responsibilities or you work irregular hours, good kind of stuff. Maybe you live in rural Italy and getting to a particular central location for a meeting is going to be extremely difficult. And crucially, you want a system where I can participate again and again and again and again, right? Ideally, I can say, I want this. And then if I change, if things do change, I can change my mind as well. Also, you want to do more than a survey where people go, everything is crap and I would like more of everything, please. To the point of the last presentation, but one, you will never meet demand. So this is often about in difficult moments of trade-offs, which of these things is really important? How do we prioritize? Um, you also probably, the problem with the survey is it doesn't involve people talking to each other, revealing their preferences, explaining their reasoning, revealing their identities and talking to other people, that's often very hard to do in a 60-minute participation meeting in a, in a particular place. 
And a lot of these are developed for consensus building. And what that says behind the text is feedback loops. People need to see that something is happening with the information that you are giving them. Uh, I'm going to rush through this stuff very quickly. There are difficulties. Interestingly, the security of data is a big one, but it is not the biggest one. Uh, fraud is the biggest one. We try and do this kind of thing. Uh, people putting misinformation, often people putting up misinformation intentionally because they are radical right people that really don't like migrants. So that's very, very difficult. Trying to work out how you have these kind of systems while protecting people, uh, while allowing people to participate easily, very, very hard. Um, often probably what you could think of as constituting the demos, right? Like who counts, who signs up for these programs? How do you have a kind of membership system? Very, very difficult to do. Um, often you just have to use the technology that people want to use. So for a long time, so yeah, here's the European Commission saying signal, we must use signal. And refugees to a man went, no. Um, Syrians usually use WhatsApp, most countries. Uh, the Ukrainians use Telegram. So in the end, UNHCR said, screw it, we're not going to use Signal, we're going to use Telegram instead, because refugees will use what they will use. You can't order them to use something else, particularly not if you're supposed to be empowering them by making these decisions. Um, and a bigger problem, particularly in a kind of camp context, we tend to assume a very individualist pattern of phone use, right? It's your phone and it's your account. That may well not be true. This phone may be exchanged and shared and, uh, you know, by all sorts of people. So what it means for an individual to be registering their opinion using it, difficult. <laughs> uh, you probably know this one. Access is a huge problem. Huh. This is Wave. If you've never played around with Wave, I encourage you to. Uh, Wave shows you how accessible your websites really are for people with disabilities and so on. If you have a website and you've not run it through Wave, you should. Um, this I put up here to show you, however, this is often not as bad as we think it is. If Somalia can have a displacement platform which is used by Somalians, most places can, right? So we often assume that there is no digital connectivity. That is usually not true. 25 seconds left, we can do this. Um, this is the automated system you and HR already use in Ecuador. I can talk more about that later if you like. Um, this is what they do with WhatsApp in Greece, because they tried doing a simpler group system and it just got overwhelmed by spam almost immediately. That's difficult, but again, it's not insoluble. And this is the big one. Refugees are extremely good at spotting bullshit. They can smell it. Um, they have often been subject to an awful lot of bullshit by the time they have their first interaction with an organization like UNHCR. And real participation involves admitting that you may not be right. In fact, that it is not for you to decide and that you are actually willing to delegate power. That is the really difficult bit. That is the real barrier I expect and why we keep doing this over and over again. That's my email address if you want to hear more. Thank you very much. You may have guessed we are in a session now on future perspectives and policy innovation. The next presentation is by Gael Moritia. And the previous one was Will Jones, advocate professor at the Faculty of Law of the University of Copenhagen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gail Bortier. I'm a PhD student at the University of Antwerp, and today I'm going to tell you a bit more about my doctoral research on building programs for newly arrived migrants and the impact on their social network. Um, first, I'm going to quickly introduce the topic of my PhD research. Uh, as I said before, I study so-called buddy programs for newly arrived migrants. Driven by an increasing focus on active citizenship, buddy programs have gained popularity in various areas of social welfare policy uh, during the last decade, such as housing, uh, poverty, mental health care. 
Uh, in research literature, different terms are, are not only used next to each other, but also used interchangeably. Um, despite the lack of a common definition, uh, Varova and Les Zanabo developed a concept of education of learning programs based on an extensive literature view of the diverse types of learning programs. So they describe a buddy program as an organized social intervention in which two students, in this case an immigrant newcomer and a local volunteer, so the buddy, are matched one on one through the uh, intervention of a professional organization in order to meet a request for support of the participants, here the immigrant newcomer. More specifically, a buddy program is not about spontaneous relationships, but the program introduces two strangers to each other. Uh, furthermore, the relationship, uh, the buddy is not a professional caregiver, but a volunteer. Uh, last, the relationship does not operate in isolation, but it explains within the framework of an organization in which the dual establishes conflict on a regular basis. In the context of immigrant integration, the buddy may assist newcomers in their efforts in integrating in whole society and rebuilding their support system. Uh, buddies may uh, assist. A buddy can offer helpful guidance in a variety of areas, such as the newcomer's job search, uh, improving language skills, enhance, uh, increasing awareness of values of the whole society, and enhancing abilities to access resources and services. Uh, furthermore, a buddy can also improve the psychological well being of a newcomer by reducing the loneliness and the social isolation on the one hand, and increasing self confidence, uh, resilience, and quality of life on the other. Uh, buddy programs have officially been part of the Flemish Civic Integration Park since this year. And the goal of implementing buddy programs in integration policy is to build a social network for newcomers uh, outside their own ethnic group, which in turn would speed up their integration process. It is expected that, buddy, uh, that newcomers participating in the buddy program would expand their social network in the whole society. We argue that buddy programs reflect recent trends of the local tour in migrant integration policy. On the one hand, we note a decentralization which shifts responsibility to local governments to organize these buddy programs. On the other hand, local governments, uh, various local governments, had buddy programs in place long before they were introduced as an uh, instrument for policy, uh, migration policy. So in this regard, local actors and more specifically cities tend to be proactive on migrant integration, often in response to their specific local situation. Uh, this study draws on literature on social networks and brokerage. Um, literature on social network and brokerage typically employs a very specific meaning of brokerage involving a particular structural pattern in which uh, other Otherwise, disconnected authors are connected to a third party. Uh, Oxfeld and colleagues argue to a broadened approach to brokerage by distinguishing between this brokerage structure and brokers as a process. Uh, brokers as a process is behavior by which an actor influences, manages, or facilitates interaction between other actors to imply a broader range of activity that different forms of brokerage activity might involve. So brokerage as a process just refers to social behavior of third party. Uh, furthermore, Simo um, distinguished three orientations toward brokerage. First is convey brokerage. Um, the convey brokers involves the passing of information between parties, and the broker mediates rather than moderates the relationship between two parties. Uh, second, Tertius Gardens is about conflict and competition between two parties that benefits the broker. And then the Zoom brokerage is, um, involves the broker introduction or facilitation of two other parties. So the humans act actively pursues connection and network expansion is likely to involve disconnecting of un uh, previously unconnected parties. Uh, in practice, brokerage often entails a combination of orientations. So why is an ethnically diverse network important or useful for immigrant newcomers? Uh, Bird argues that when people focus on activities inside their own groups, uh, holes in information flows between groups are created, or more simply structural holes. Whereas people whose, whose network bridge the holes between groups have access to a broader diversity of information. This is a mechanism by which brokers become social capital. Especially weaker interracial ties are perceived as more effective in bridging social distance. In other words, uh, weak ties are more likely to be members of different groups 
and strong ones, which tend to be concentrated within particular groups. Granometer uh, considers weak size as indispensable to individual opportunities and to their integration into communities. That brings us to the following research question. How do coordinators of buddy programs and volunteer buddies take up their broker's role with a view to expanding the social network of income and commerce in society? Uh, since a buddy program artificially brings two strangers together, we want, uh, to have, we want to gain a better idea of how brokers as a process takes place. On the one hand, we look at how coordinators take on this broker's role, um, since he's the one who brings the volunteer and the, and the newcomer together. On the other hand, we want to look at how the volunteer very fulfills his broker's role and whether or not further social context results from this. And this will give, uh, give us a better idea about how very programs uh, do or do not contribute to expanding the new social network. To answer the research question, uh, the study uses a realist evaluation. Uh, the realist evaluation uh, finds inspiration in the underpinnings of critical realism which argues that the social world cannot be understood through direct empirical observation. Um, as a result, the, the focus is broadened from empirical observations to theorizing the underlying and often invisible causes or, of uh, or genetic mechanisms that give rise to certain events and generalities. So, a focus to, add, uh, to asking whether a buddy program works for network expansion, um, a real evaluation then focuses on what works for whom, under which circumstances, why, and how. To achieve this, a real evaluation develops, tests, and refines so-called program theories uh, that explicate the underlying assumptions of different stakeholders of, of how change is brought about. To get, to get a better idea of how brokerage as a process takes place in buddy programs, I interviewed both coordinators of buddy programs and volunteer buddies. So coordinators are people whose job it is to monitor the buddy program, they do the intake interviews, uh, the matching, and they intervene when necessary. Uh, the volunteer buddies are uh, members of the host community, and um, they usually live in the same city or municipality as the newcomer, and they do stay committed to accompanying the newcomer for a certain period of time. Uh, before we look at how coordinators and buddies take up their brokerage role, uh, first, three remarks should be made. The first remark is the assumption that an immigrant newcomer entering a buddy program has no social network in the whole society is not always true. Uh, some already have a large network, usually, usually consisting of people from their own ethnic community. The cancer coordinators in the EQ say they, don't know, they, they do not know whether the buddy program effectively achieves network expansion. Uh, moreover, the objective or the expectation of network expansion is usually not explicitly communicated to the buddies, but it's rather uh, expected to be an automatic outcome of the buddy program. Um, the assumption here is that um, getting to know one person from the host population would cause a newcomer to make a new social context. However, uh, pre previous research contradicts this. A close relationship between buddy and newcomer may be insufficient to expand the newcomer to new newcomer social network. So the buddy should show active and experienced connecting behavior to expand the newcomer social network beyond the diet. Uh, third, the agency of the immigrant newcomer in brokerage is not to be underestimated. So although they, uh, they participate in the buddy program, not every, buddy wish, uh, not every newcomer wishes to connect or broaden the network in whole society. Many prioritize practicing the language with their buddy or receiving practical support. What's the main result? Yeah? What's the main result? Yes. Yeah. Okay, when looking at um, Social networking, you find that coordinators take on a numerous program role, both in a brief and sustainable way, uh, depending on the program studies. In a brief, role, um, the coordinator does a matching between the buddy and the newcomer, often based on category and common interests, and introduces the two to each other. After the introduction, the coordinator lets the duo shape their relationship largely on their own and only rarely intervenes in between them. So the coordinator role diminishes in importance over time or simply not offered. In sustained numerous role, the coordinator's um, facilitation, uh, the ongoing facilitation is required. So the coordinator constantly monitors how the relationship between the public and the community is going. Um, I will take this. Um, so um, then we look at the, uh, the broker's role of the, of the buddies. 
uh, after interviewing several buddies we see that some duos go into close friendships so uh, strong ties that last beyond the buddy program while for others the context remains rather superficial uh, and limited to the impulse for, for the time this consists with the view that organized encounters do not necessarily translate into close lasting relationships um, the interviews show that volunteer buddies engage both in grumpy brokers as well as the brokers so grumpy brokers as i mentioned before uh, involves the passing of information between parties the buddies play a major referral role here uh, the buddy informs the newcomer about all kinds of resources such as organization leisure activities services institutions and so on and often joins the newcomer the first time um, this assumes a certain profile of a of buddy namely someone with someone with great knowledge of how institutions and services work so not, not everybody can take on this brokerage role. Um, to a lesser extent, the buddy takes on the, uh, the role of a business youngest broker, uh, according to the needs of the newcomer. He can do this by introducing the newcomer to his own social network, such as family, friends, and acquaintances, and by inviting the newcomer to his home, for example. Again, agency of the buddy is not to be underestimated, as not every buddy wishes to allow the newcomer into their private sphere. Another observation here is that not everybody has an extensive social network. So not uh, some of them are even lonely, so they cannot always take this uh, brokerage call. Um, we see that trust is an important condition for the body to play a broker role. Uh, when the newcomer trusts his body, he will perceive information received as true, and the newcomer will be more inclined to meet new people through his body. Uh, while the body can take can play a valuable role in expanding the newcomer's social network. There are several limitations. Uh, for example, lim limited language proficiency of the newcomer is often seen as a barrier to introduce the newcomer into the buddy's social circle. Furthermore, uh, poor mental health, limited financial resources, and especially the need for practical or instrumental support, as in the case of housing problems and administration, are seen as challenges to see to lead the newcomer to know social context. Um, the need for practical support is often perceived by the buddy as more urgent than making informal contacts for the newcomer. In addition, although it's an objective of the buddy program, not everybody sees network expansion as a task. So not everybody fulfills this brokerage role or only to a limited extent. Uh, so in many cases, networking is limited to a temporary one-to-one -one contact between, between buddy and newcomer. Um, I will to the conclusion of this presentation. Uh, the interviews paint a mixed picture of networking. This means that the Flemish innovation policy assumption that a buddy leads to a larger social network for the newcomer is not always true. Uh, whether buddies and coordinators take on a broker role uh, depends on many factors. Moreover, points of heterogeneity in relationships, for this everyone uh, operates in such a liberal context is more of an action problem, or a challenge of coordinating people with different interests, English perspectives, and language. So uh, increases in, in, in heterogeneity demands greater brokerage intensity in order to, to produce results. Um, <laughs> but we know that the intensity of uh, the brokerage role of the coordinators is often limited to uh, introducing and matching the duos, and it's, up, it's difficult to expect this brokerage intensity from volunteer bodies. Um, in further analysis of the interviews, I will explore whether there is a correlation between type of contact between body and newcomer whether it's a weak tie or a strong tie, and brokers will be very taken up by the body. There is some uh, evidence that there is. For example, when there is a good match, a personal connection between body and newcomer, the body will be more inclined to introduce the newcomer into its social circle and take on a, a youngest broker role. Uh, the next step in the research is to interview immigrant newcomers themselves about their experience with the body program and the impact on their social network. I would like to thank you for your time. This is the research of the Center for Research and Environmental Change of the Development of Antwerp. This is her research. So we have now Margarita Poshati. She's the, yeah. uh, at the municipality of Fontanigoymash. Fontanigoy. In Liguria, urban Italy. And the Claudia Payan that was shelter. 
the persons. And uh, yes, and Margarita, who is from the other town. Yeah. No, te lo enviamos el nombre. Ah, ok. El nombre. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. Um, I will speak about the uh, reception center in a little villages uh, in the northwest of uh, Italy. Uh, they are very, very little uh, villages uh, in the mountains, far from the first uh, town, which is Genova, where you can find all the services for population. And um, as it is far from uh, the city center, um, people have migrated far from these countries. And uh, in the last 10, uh, uh, in the last century, uh, this territory lost uh, uh, most of population. Uh, at, the, at the moment, the, the, the loss of population had as a consequence also the loss of the public services. Um, because of these characteristics, uh, our territory, territory was involved in the Italy's national strategy for inner areas, uh, which is a national uh, strategy uh, to de develop these areas, um, services, and the um, economy of these territories. In 2018, started our reception center of Fontanigorda and Rovenio. Uh, this is part of the SAI, which is the Italian public system for the reception of uh, asylum seekers and refugees. And uh, it is funded uh, and managed by public bodies. Uh, our project is very small, and it is uh, just in two different uh, buildings, one in Fontanigorda and one in Rovenio. The two buildings are public properties that have been and that now are restored thanks to the project. We had a lot of challenges in uh, uh, developing, in uh, starting the project, but the important challenge was how to ensure in a territory in which also local people has projects to access to services. And uh, I, I refer to public transport, health services, and education. So I will show you some challenges we had to, to deal with. And the first was how to ensure adult education in Fontanigorda and Rovenio. As you can see from the map, um, it's very complicated to reach uh, the, the town of Genova, where the schools are located, and uh, um, it takes more than two hours and a half. Okay, it's more than two hours and a half with public transport to, to reach the city center, and so it's impossible to follow the lessons because the lessons are in the afternoon and there is no bus run when you finish. Our solution was the so-called Aula Gora, which is a half online education program uh, that um, guarantee adult basic education. Students stay in the territory uh, in the so-called Aula Gora. In this case, as you can see, we used the city council room as a, as a classroom. And um, the teachers are connected from the city of Genova while a tutor is present in the classroom to help students to interact with teachers online. In this case, the tutor was Claudia Priano, who is here next to me. And um, this method was first presented during the inner area strategy, but started in 2021. And as you can see, the first results were uh, in June uh, 2021, five beneficiaries obtained the diploma and a social, social operator, which is, who is Claudia, um, uh, worked as a tutor and then decided to uh, study and obtain an important certification in teaching Italian to foreign, stu to foreign students. 
Also, the teachers in Genova have acquired the skills in distance learning because it was the, their first experience. Uh, next steps, um, these services has been opened to the local people. And uh, um, this Aula Agora became a stable services for citizens. Um, another uh, challenge was uh, professional training. As you can imagine, no training institution has arrived in our valley, but we have a professional forest operator who has a forest instruction license. So we organized the theor theoretical and practical course for the safe use of the change so that has been rec recognized by uh, the local re region of Liguria, the local uh, authority. Uh, and uh, um, as for the school, also this service has been offered to all the, po all the population. Uh, another to deal with was how to grant support for job plus placement. Uh, also in this case, uh, there is no uh, big companies and other productive uh, realities for work training. Uh, uh, so um, we work inclusion path with the local small companies and also will, with the city centers of expertise. Uh, as you can see here, there is uh, um, apple production, but also trout breeding and so on. Um, we had a big co cooperation with a, a social cooperative based in Genova, um, but already operating the territory. And uh, as you can see, uh, we obtained different results, such as training for beneficiaries of our project. Um, the fact that the refugees and the local people uh, work together, uh, and so on. Another uh, challenge was to reuse a public library. Uh, and here, volunteering uh, is also um, present in, 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 together with another um, work inclusion path for a beneficiary. And also um, creating meaningful personal relationships between uh, beneficiaries and uh, uh, local people. Uh, we also reused an abandoned school, creating a, a shared space for work and study and a digital museum educational laboratory that has been used uh, by uh, local people and refugees. And as you can see here, uh, we combined different funds and different activities involving the University of Genova, for example, and also associations. And again, a refugee was involved in opening the, this service. And as you can see, there, is, there are uh, a lot of benef benefits, uh, both for local people and refugees. In conclusion, I can say that small towns in inner areas are places of experimentation for innovative practices and that hospitality is an opportunity for development and innovation. It is important to use local resources and uh, to have a strong alliance with the city centers of expertise and to use um, different funds of uh, funding. Um, we obtained the reuse of abandoned public assets, a creation of new services uh, calibrated on the need, real need of the territory, and uh, we realized uh, uh, new services created for beneficiaries and opened to the community. And that there was a role reversal as the beneficiaries of the reception center um, be became a provider of services for and with the local community. Just five, um, some minutes to, uh, because Claudia Priano will tell us, will to, will tell us um, what was our beginning. Thank you. Uh, you see, we are in the mountain. Huh? Uh, when the project was announced uh, in uh, 2017 uh, to the inhabitants uh, uh, of the villages, it wasn't an option. At the time, Margarita Squashati was the manager of uh, the village of Fotaligorda. She put together all the population and said that Fotaligorda would host an immigrant reception project. The reaction was very strong and very clear. Panics were fading, and the message was, we don't want them here. 
in the little village of Kadanawa, Yamutai Goda, two or three kilometers, is located the house for the men. Uh, before immigrants arrived, uh, that house was very infamous by unknown people who came in the night and they broke all the water pipes in the house. Also, we operators had problems despite we live in the villages and all people know us and we know very well all people and the social context. So the challenge was very ambitious. We have to accept people who fear of unknown, which is not an easy feeling to manage, leave time to people, and it was a uh, important because after the first month, the moment of aggression, a moment of curiosity appeared, and uh, to play down, to go out from the collective drama. I would like to tell you uh, a funny little episode, uh, a joke I made. One afternoon, before the first uh, beneficiaries arrived, uh, some men called me to offer me a coffee. Uh, you know that uh, uh, Italy still uh, has a, still a strong patriarchal uh, tradition and culture, women at home and men at work and so on, not everywhere, but in our small village, the situation is still so. Uh, so when they asked me, Claudia, tell us what can do African boys all the day, all the day here, I answered very seriously, African boys will do many things. Among others, they will organize a course only for Italian men, during which they will teach them how to cook, to sew, <laughs> use the iron to clothes, and how to clean home. <laughs> There was a moment of silence, uh, uh, you know, perhaps 10 seconds. The men look <laughs> each other, <laughs> at each other, then one begin to laugh, and uh, they all understood that I was uh, joking, not so much, but I was. <laughs> so, one day the first two Nigerians uh, arrived, and when the others, very young people from Africa, Asia, uh, and so on, and the family arrived, uh, the melting, the, the meeting uh, uh, solved the situation. Our work was, first of all, uh, to facilitate mate, meeting and uh, integration. And uh, now our guests have friends, and the native people of village are part of their lives. Uh, in this year, many French were born between Italians and not Italians. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Guido and Roberta are from Codici Ricerche and Interventi, which is uh, uh, yeah. 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 yeah, okay. <laughs> No, no, perché abbiamo la plena, c'è l'ultima. Okay, thank you so much. Hello, everybody. So we have the pleasure to be the last of this uh, first day of conference. Hope you enjoy it because we are the last one. <laughs> But dinner is arriving, so that's another bit of passion. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, so just briefly, who we are, uh, younger picture of us. 
So if you uh, Roberto and me, you will find our email uh, there. Uh, we are two practitioners uh, with uh, uh, both uh, academic backgrounds uh, in the field of uh, urban study and urban sociology. And uh, we work for an, an organization, an independent organization based in uh, Milan. Codice um, is an independent organization that support uh, uh, with the research practices and uh, uh, an effective approach uh, stakeholders that are active in uh, social policies. We have been uh, dealing uh, much with the youth policies, uh, migration policies, uh, how so all, all, all the matters of uh, uh, social policies at least. But today we are uh, speaking about uh, migration. <laughs> so just to set the framework, um, uh, we pointed out four um, important characteristics to us of the uh, reception system of uh, forced migrants in Italy, that is the background uh, that we are, um, on, on which we are moving. Uh, I'm not uh, going through, but it is just important that uh, uh, you mark the difference between uh, with the double track integration system because uh, uh, much of the uh, of, of, uh, of our reflection of our thoughts are based on this uh, double categorization uh, between the emergency accommodation which in the last ordinary and structural for the region and uh, another uh, system which is uh, this uh, SAI uh, system uh, that was supposed to to be ordinary, but it has become more residual uh, in, in the time. Meaning that uh, in this background, we are we have lowered the standard of the reception system uh, with, the, with respect to an ordinary system with higher standards. Uh, that means that uh, uh, positive outcomes uh, in the paths of uh, reception and integration of person migrants are uh, kind of uh, turning the wheel of fortune. It depends on uh, where you land. You, you may be uh, lucky enough to find some uh, characteristics of a non-hostile context of uh, uh, active NGOs, uh, of uh, um, political willingness to foster integration processes. Uh, and um, therefore, we listen here uh, some of the uh, characteristics that we have in mind when we speak about uh, uh, the wheel of fortune that is turning. Uh, we are looking at local context, meaning uh, if, uh, whether they are connected, uh, accessible. Uh, uh, I mean, man, many of these uh, of these thoughts have been already presented uh, uh, in, uh, in this day's presentation. Um, you may skip this one. Mm -hmm. uh, and we propose here a, a comparative analysis based on uh, three different programs uh, on which we, we were able to work. Uh, we see projects funded either by EU funds or uh, national funding programs, national foundations such as bank foundations, for example. Um, all these programs have uh, the aim to support institutions at different territorial level uh, to face the challenges of force and migrants. Their aim is uh, to strengthen multi-level governance structure, uh, to promote uh, local policies for a better inclusion, and uh, to make uh, migrants participate in the decision-making process. Uh, whether this uh, is uh, adopted as a methodology of work or it is a specific aim to make migrants more uh, uh, participants. Uh, our role as a, a practitioner and researcher um, is uh, to coordinate and implement activities in support of the local governance. Uh, Uh, doing uh, a program itself, and, uh, uh, for example, the reception system at the local level. Uh, so there is a quest uh, some questions underneath our contribution <laughs> today. Uh, money is not everything. We have been uh, saying this a lot. Uh, it is not enough just to have uh, funding and to uh, put projects uh, on, <laughs> on a local context to make it better. Uh, but we are trying to look at some conditions that uh, to us are needed to improve uh, the local government, uh, governance of migration in uh, small and medium cities. Uh, our proposal is uh, to look at three different dimensions that are recurring throughout uh, the presentation of these uh, programs that we are uh, talking about today. 
uh, we do not see this uh, at all, but <laughs> it's the, the, the role of uh, PA, public authorities, and its engagement in programs uh, and projects. Uh, the existing networks that are supporting uh, integration and uh, um, reception uh, pathways of migrants and uh, the migrant participation itself. Um, so this is a map of Italy. We are very much on that, as we like them. Um, we work pretty much here in Milan, where we are based, and our projects are mostly in the northern part of Italy. Uh, but we work with this, uh, uh, within this program. Capacity building prefecture. Prefecture are the uh, local, uh, um, uh, yeah, local prefectures. Okay, that was pretty much the same word. Fine, uh, local prefecture. And we have been working with uh, Alessandria in Piedmont region, uh, Rieti, very much close to Rome uh, in the Appennini, so mountains, medium, uh, uh, small town, and, and Sassari. Isolated on the north part of Sardinia. Um, then we present we will present uh, um, a project that we develop with the metropolitan uh, city of Milan. So not in Milan city, but on the outskirts, the whole territory of the metropolitan region, uh, and it dwelt with the unaccompanied minors. And uh, uh, Mano Mano is a project founded by a, a national bank foundation. Uh, that took place in the province of Lodi. So it's uh, an agricultural area on the south of the metropolitan area of Milan. Okay, I will uh, take the floor and I will also stand because this time I have to uh, wake you up a bit. <laughs> so I will uh, give you some information of the three projects we have been uh, working on. So as uh, uh, Widow said, the first one is uh, this uh, capacity building uh, about uh, with the prefecture, with the uh, we have the three uh, cities and the and Sassi. And here you can have a look at some data. I will not go through it, just have a look uh, to see that uh, there are some big differences among uh, these contexts. Just have a look below. Which are compared, for example, uh, immigrants. Okay. Um, this, so um, this was an AMIF, uh, so an EU funded project. Uh, the program wanted to want to support the public authority uh, introducing innovative practices with regards to professional training, for example. So they, we through this project we want to capacitate people that work at the prefecture in order to give uh, uh, a better uh, response to uh, forced migrant reception. And then there is an important activity which deals with the monitoring of uh, a reception center. It means that uh, Guido and I, together with people from working in the prefecture, were going in the centers where uh, refugees are uh, um, welcomed to look at the building, look at the activities they are, um, they are provided with, and we were evaluating the, um, the reception center and uh, its activities. And then promoting multi-stakeholder collaborative practices in the governance of migration, so a more general objective. The need addressed here was to uh, make the response of the local public authorities more efficient in the management of forced migrants specifically in what we call CAS reception center, which are the emergency track that we were explaining before, okay, which are now more ordinary uh, reception uh, track. Uh, in this slide, you can see more or less, okay, a ranking uh, uh, of our three main dimensions. So we evaluate a bit, like we have uh, here uh, um, a strong engagement, a strong presence, of the uh, public authority. Uh, existing networks were uh, quite good. There was no migrant participation, but I will go through this dimension more in detail. Uh, please. Okay, D2 was, uh, uh, as I said, a project in the Lombardy region about uh, unaccompanied um, foreign minors. Uh, I just want to um, put your attention here. This is a card that was uh, uh, produced in the project. So this project had a really strong focus on participatory, participatory activities with minors. 
we uh, we consult we made consultation with minors in order to um, uh, grasp their voice to uh, ameliorate uh, policies that that shape their lives. So here it says uh, it's uh, the voice of one of the minor we we work with saying. Please listen more to our voice because in our little voice, there's always some pain inside. Okay. Um, please. So, uh, well, I have just uh, already explained about uh, uh, the, the, the main aim of the project, but it, in fact, it's about uh, uh, promoting uh, the integration of Anacopanai minor to Lombardy region, strengthening the role of the actors involved in the regional perception system. We both use uh, quantitative uh, data analysis and the consult consultative minors. And uh, uh, we wanted to raise the regional standard of reception and integration of minors and make their voice heard somehow in policy making process. Uh, Mano Mano um, is another project, uh, uh, as Guido said, uh, it uh, was in the, the Lodi province. Here you can see some data, but we go uh, faster. Uh, so it was funded by Caricula Foundation, which is a bank foundation. We aim to uh, improve reception governance through the involvement of the protector itself and the reception center in the province of Lodi. So something that is important here, the prefecture was not formally part of the project, but since the beginning, they tried to uh, engage it, but it didn't work. So as I will tell you later, the project was in fact undermined about the reluctancy of uh, the prefecture to participate in the project. Um, some, uh, a lot of, um, for example, um, implement inclusion pathways for asylum seekers, um, community building activities around commons. This is something that we've uh, seen in the previous presentation, uh, like making Italian people and asylum seekers and refugees work on something uh, which they have in common in the place they live. So like uh, refurnishing uh, buildings or this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, uh, please. So, um, yeah, it's last some minutes. Um, here you can have a general uh, analysis of the project we made. So as you can see, we have, you have the, the project uh, above and our dimensions. So uh, with regard to the family prefecture, uh, in uh, this project, the prefecture was the leader of the project. But this does not mean that this engagement was in fact real. I mean, real, I mean, uh, um actually they we saw that they um sometimes they just wanted to have some extra resources to have uh, uh, more employers to do the ordinary works so it was difficult for us to push them to innovate and to make a change okay so sometimes it was quite frustrating working in this way uh in the two uh, the public authority was the metropolitan city of milan which was just a formal leader with, not a, with any significant power in migrant policy. Yet, uh, uh, the Metropolitan City of Milan had a strong engagement to introduce uh, change and innovation in favor of uh, uh, minors, uh, doing this uh, through interinstitutional work. In the case of Manamano, I have already said, it was not possible to engage a prefecture. So, Finally, they had to change, uh, to move to another level of governance. So they work more on, uh, um, with, uh, on social local policies, so with the uh, local authorities. Um, so about networks. Uh, in uh, Fami Prefetture, so Alessandra, Rieti, and Sassari, what we saw, that there are uh, networks that are limited in number and heterogeneity. And this is something that often we can, uh, can be observed in uh, small and medium cities. Uh, so there are a few subjects uh, not very um, oriented in, uh, uh, in advocacy. So um, this can be a problem. Um, uh, the two, okay, I will go faster <laughs> because I'm dying, but still. 
you can have a look at this. So uh, you can also have a wide and a very uh, diverse network, but sometimes difficult to engage them. So this was the case of the tool. You can uh, have a number of diverse and engaged uh, subjects, but um, which are not willing to work in networks. So there are many, many different uh, situations you can experience. About participation of migrants, which is something that uh, we, we saw with very with a uh, wheel presentation. Um, in the case of SAMI, no participation was envisaged. Like we go and monitor monitoring the reception center, but they don't really uh, they have no interest in asking the refugees how do they feel, how do they, which is quite uh, uh, strong. Um, the two, in fact, was on the contrary a project in which participation was conceived as a tool to be, give migrants a voice, okay? Um, in shaping the policies that regard them. We don't really know if this really worked. Actually, I would say more no than yes. What we saw that there are important empowering effects in uh, bringing minors together in these consultancy groups. So we, we see an effect on the person less on policies, okay? Uh, okay, Mano Mano uh, also had uh, this strong participatory objective aim, but also big problems like bringing together refugees and, and Italian citizens in very small towns can be very hard. Like people do not want to participate or to meet others. This is something that can happen often. We go running to the conclusion. Uh, first, it is very difficult in general for us to evaluate the outcomes of projects. Because of this reason, maybe there are some more reasons, but we work as evaluators and it's not really easy. And more importantly, public authority often do not, are not interested in what the outcomes of projects are. Okay, so our questions, so we have more questions than responses, but how can locally driven projects, as we uh, have seen, can significantly, sorry, significantly affect the governance of reception and integration of migrants when this is something that is more rural at the national level. So how can we bring these two things together? Last slide, okay. Uh, this is another uh, open uh, question. Migrant reception in small and medium city is more a trap or is more Oh, it is, it is more an opportunity. Uh, small and medium-sized cities are contexts where pathways of reception and integration may struggle to succeed. Can be difficult to be a refugee in a small town uh, in Rieti, for example, which is not so small, but it's really difficult to access. It's close to Rome, but you have to take a, a bus, uh, which is very slow and so on. With, so being there is not that easy. But uh, these are contexts in which we think that these are contexts in which projects and intervention can make somehow the difference. Because in a hyper-local context, it seems easier to take advantage of the proximity among different levels of the governance of immigration to develop more collaborative action. This is something a little bit contradictory with what I just said, but it's to give you the idea that things are very complex in fact. And finally, we think that uh, a local project as the one we, we do um, should focus on the one hand on the support of formal aspects in, government of, uh, in the governance of migrant reception integration, but at the same time trying to promote advocacy and empowering actions, because these are the things that we saw is lacking the most in this small context. Uh, subject that can in fact uh, uh, do advocacy work and empowering uh, people there. Thank you very much. So I ask you to be patient now to the closing session. It, as yeah. Is there a risk, yeah? Okay. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for being here alive. <laughs> okay, we just let the air change a little bit. But uh, we have to run to our very last session. Uh, this last session is aimed to um, present a forthcoming book by uh, Asia Pisarevskaya and Peter Skolten. 
uh, which is not here, of course, uh, but um, she is going to present their work. Um, uh, their work is called uh, Cities of Migration Towards a Better Understanding of the Direct Urban Neighborhoods in Europe. And um, we thought that this could be a, a nice way to conclude our first day uh, of, of uh, uh, conference because it, we can have also a sort of uh, theoretical framework more general uh, to include all, all of the things that we have said uh, so far today. So I quickly leave the stage to Asia and uh, see you later. <laughs> How much time do I have? Uh, 15 minutes, because uh, at 7 we have to go yeah, out. Because they closed up. All right, well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, better. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, hi, everybody. I know it has been a really long day, so let's do a little exercise. Everybody, put your hands up. Put your hands up. Shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it. Clap it, clap it. Woo! Uh, all right. So uh, it's my pleasure to present our book, uh, Work in Progress, Scale, uh, Cities of Migration. Next slide. So uh, Peter Scotton and I decided to do this study because we saw that uh, an amount of literature produced uh, at the local level of studies on urban level of studies had grown immensely in the past few decades. But we still didn't know a few things. For instance, we didn't have a, we don't have a typology really of urban diversities, and we don't really know how cities differ. We know they differ, and that. Diver uh, migration diversity plays out in different ways in global cities, completely different way than in small and medium sized cities, cities that are at the center of global exchanges and cities that are at the um, periphery. So uh, we build on local turn about which you have heard already from many people. And um, there were many single case studies on various diversity in different lo uh, localities in Europe and also outside Europe. But still, there was a lot of focus on global or top scale cities. So like New York, London, Amsterdam, Berlin. So these cities have been studied most of the time. And we didn't know much about others. And we also didn't know, what um, say, didn't have many medium size uh, selections. So it, it is either one or two cases maybe but uh, not enough studies that look at more than two or three cases. So some theoretical underpinnings, um, we have been building on comparative theory of locality by the Schiller and scale cities, low and down scale cities, depending on how prominent they are in terms of economy, politics, and opportunities for migrants. We also build on a work of our colleague, Lawrence von Bergen, that studied typology of local governance um, in the 16 cities of the Netherlands. And on our own work, where we try to do like a quantitative classification of different types of cities and how they, uh, what are their social, demographic, and economic characteristics, we define different clusters of cities. So, but this book will go a bit further. Next slide. <laughs> um, so first we conducted a systematic literature review to identify which factors actually influence migration-related diversity and migration-related segregation in cities. Then we did a quantitative mapping of cities in France, Netherlands, Germany, and Italy uh, in terms of their migration and diversity levels and residential segregation. And uh, from these, more than 300 cities, we have selected 16 for in-depth case studies. And then we did a comparative uh, qualitative analysis, QCA, to understand the relationships between the factors and the different types of diversity configurations. So these are the factors that we have considered. Uh, we grouped them in three categories uh, related to mobility. So history of migration, types of migration flows, levels of international mobility, so how, how much there was immigration or out migration. Inequalities, we looked at urban economic opportunity structures, so what kind of areas migrants can find jobs in cities, for instance. Inequalities between migrants and non-migrants in terms of education and income 
as well as awareness and presence of discrimination against minors. And then the third group of factors are political institutional factors. We looked at type of urban policies, um, urban politics, and local governance. And then we uh, kind of try to understand what is the relationship here between the way how uh, volume and variety of migration-related diversity and spread of diversity is playing out in different types of cities. And important to notice here is that we only looked at first-generation migrants. So we don't consider descendants of migrants actually migrants. So we don't take them into account in this study. We only look at first generation. Next slide, please. So here you can see uh, the mapping. And we have on the, this side, you see the segregation extent. So here there are more segregated cities, here are less segregated cities. And here you can see the extent of diversity. So and different colors are different countries, but yeah, that's less important. So we have divided this group, this cloud, into four parts. Um, cities that are diverse but not so segregated, cities that are both diverse and segregated, cities that are non-diverse but very segregated, and cities that are a lot less segregated and also not diverse. So from each of these quadrants, we selected four cities representing one country each that could be similar, and we tried to select from the center of these clusters to compare them. So that's most different system design, if you know what I mean. Next. <laughs> so here is the cities we have selected. Uh, the colors represent different quadrants, uh, right? So we looked at Constance, Paris, Parma, Hilversum as highly diverse but lower segregated cities. Uh, Ingolstadt, Nimes, Modena, and Rotterdam as highly diverse and highly segregated cities. Plauen, Van, Cosenza, Lubad represented our low diversity and high segregation cities. And the Sao Roslo, Dutinghem, Rouen, and Vier Regio uh, represented low diversity and broad, uh, low segregation cities. Next slide. So then we did a qualitative comparative analysis. So we looked in depth into the cities. Our fieldwork was during COVID, unfortunately. So we relied a lot on background data and um, online interviews with experts, uh, so either researchers or representatives of municipalities and geos that are based in those cities to understand the better the context. We also looked at the statistical data from the countries and the localities themselves. And we um, yeah, looked in the time frame from 2011 to 2019. Then we compared, we kind of, based on all these factors that I showed you in the second slide, Mm, we have defined sort of ideal types yeah, for each dimension. And we uh, categorized each city to an extent how this dimension is represented in this city. So that's how uh, we did this through a method of fuzzy set QCA, but I won't go into detail. So it just was our way to uh, formalize a bit the qualitative comparative uh, aspect of the cities because we have so different data, so, so different sources. So we had to find a way, like a measure in a way to categorize them, which are more similar, which are different uh, with respect to each other. Next slide. And this is what we found. So first of all, we have found a clear relationship between economy and diversity. So uh, when cities are highly diverse, they also show strong economy, long migration history, and diverse migration inflows. So what do I mean by diverse migration inflows? It means that uh, there were different kinds of migrants coming in the cities throughout this uh, long and medium migration history. So from refugees to labor migrants, to highly skilled, to students, to family migrants. And these flows just have been going on and on historically. And these all cities share a strong economy as well. Then cities with lower diversity levels on the contrary, show a weaker economy, shorter migration history, and limited diversity of migration inflows. So maybe some cities have mostly refugees, or some cities have mostly students, or um, yeah, maybe European labor migrants as a majority group, and the rest are less represented. Then we have also found that um, cities that are segregated, they are also highly unequal 
So there is a high inequality, higher inequality between uh, migrants and non-migrants, uh, but actually not all cities that are highly unequal are segregated. So residential segregation actually relates to the structures of the housing market. And in the post-industrial cities, especially, there are areas that have been historically inhabited by, by blue collar workers, and they are historically hosting population that cannot afford, uh, let's say, housing that is more expensive. So in Moderna and Parma, Parma, we see that the areas where the Southern Italian workers have been living in the 60s and 70s, now these are homes of newly arrived migrants. Um, yeah, so next slide. Mm. In terms of political and institutional factors, we actually didn't find very clear relationships. And I think this is a food for thought for everybody here. Uh, so for instance, mm, well, maybe we have found something that relates to strong localist governance that is observed mostly in a highly diverse cities. Um, so what do I mean by strong localist governance? It's um, when municipalities are proactively innovating um, their mi migration reception and in inclusion policies for migrants uh, that have a clear vision and have a clear leadership in the way how they manage migration and diversity in their places. So um, we kind of expected that it would be more in the cities that have more experience with diversity, but actually the Sao Roslo and Dutin camp surprised us because despite not being very diverse, they still have strong localist governance. Next slide. Uh, then we look also at the influence or relation with um, political um, political context, so to say. So we looked at the um, municipalities uh, and their councils and mayorships and looked at what kind of political orientation municipalities have. But we actually, in our selection, didn't really find a very clear link. So as you can see, uh, well, right-wing local governments observed in Parma and Minsk and well, what does it say about others? It doesn't really um, it doesn't really show a link because well, even though others also have maybe right wing government, but it doesn't really in our analysis of QCA it didn't match with any other characteristics. So it's just maybe a random yeah coincidence. And at the same time, the same cities in the same box can also have left wing local government. So. We are not sure yet what exactly does it say about our analysis. As I said, it's work in progress, so maybe we'll figure it out later. <laughs> Next slide. Yeah, uh, also we looked at the type of policy. So for instance, we try to understand whether there are any difference between these groups of cities in terms of like, do they have a cultural, uh, interculturalist policies that are maybe among cities that are highly diverse only? Not really. Interculturalist diversity policies, this uh, kind of color, the pink one, is observed both in highly diverse and also lowly diverse cities. And it's also diverse, uh, observed in both highly unequal cities and not so unequal cities. And the same as integration or reception policies, they are kind of observed all over um, our sample. And they also coexist sometimes with uh, interculturalist or diversity policies. Um, yeah, so we propose a um, tentative typology of cities of migration, which is mainly based on this linkage between um, economy, history of migration, diversity of immigration flows, and um, segregation and level of diversity. So there, these are three types of so non-diverse or low-skill cities that represent limited diversity, mixed uh, flows that are mixed uh, residentially and have weaker economies. So we have a VI agent as a representative of this type. Then we have uh, segregated low-skill cities, but they can also be called new migration cities or pass-through cities up to discussion. And these cities have limited diversity higher inequality and sometimes higher segregation too, and a relatively weaker economy than others. Then we have middle-class cities that are relatively prosperous, 
highly diverse uh, and have also, they're not so segregated. There is some segregation, but it's not so pronounced. The representatives of these are Hilderson and Constant. And then uh, post-industrial cities that are highly diverse, highly unequal, and highly segregated. But at the same time, they have strong economy. And these are uh, Paris, Harman, Ingolstadt, modern Europe, and Dunedin. So with this, I'll close. And well, thank you so much for attention, for bearing with me until the very end. <laughs> compressed uh, the discussion that will take place uh, tomorrow in a specific session so we have uh, uh, with the round table and tonight at dinner so <laughs> the dinner is at Carduni yeah. at uh, the earliest uh, I don't need a list I just gave a number we're 35 Carduni perfect so they yes. know my name you can uh, say for uh, how do you write uh, it Panacea Andriopoulou uh, write down the name of the restaurant Carduni just before you leave uh, a communication please from the center Sorry for that. Just an information for you. This area is a little bit weird. Uh, so if you go now, please try not to walk alone on the streets. Take a taxi or uh, some people together. Here, in the opposite street, there is a mall. Yes. I think you have a friend to get. Yes. 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 Yes